I think we have three um, uh, topics in this panel. Um, uh, the psychology of genocide, uh, Mr. Marwan Mohammed is not coming, I think, from Charmo University, is not attending because of a problem. Um, <clears throat> so we want to, uh, I don't know if uh, um, Mr. Uh, Yaniv Volar, University of Kent is uh, here. Yes, I'm here. Okay, that's good. Welcome. Uh, there is um, a long experience with the militias in Iraq and uh, authorities in Baghdad benefited a lot of uh, from these militias. The advent of the Ba'athists to power began with the militia. To find out more, we will listen to Dr. Vani Yaniv Bolar in the University of Kant. Uh, please, uh, Dr. Vani. Thank you so much. I just wonder, I have, I have a PowerPoint prepared presentation. Can, do, I, um, do I have the permission to share my screen? I think it is. Can I, can uh, I yeah. try for just a quick minute? I don't want to cause too much trouble. Mm -hmm. Let's, let me try. If not, I can do it without the presentation. Yes, just uh, please just try and we will see if uh, it will let you. Can you, can you see it? Yes, yeah, we are seeing okay. it, yes. Excellent, brilliant. Okay, so I'm going to start the presentation now. Um, and um, so okay, before I begin, actually, I, I would like to clarify that what I'm presenting here today is actually based on research that, um, that I've, I've already carried out um, and that has been published. And you, I mean, you know, usually in these, usually in these panels and conferences, you, you present your work in order to get some feedback on, on ongoing research. But in this case, I'm, I'm actually using my existing work to attract more, uh, more attention to what I've been doing. And, um, and of course, to the subject of open violence and, the, uh, and the, the genocide. And the research that I've done for, on, on this project uh, was actually based primarily in the Ba'ath Party archives at Stanford University. So as some of you probably know, um, quite a few uh, uh, quite a few documents were captured first in 1991 by the Peshmerga and then in 2003 by the coalition forces and these documents were captured and they were transferred to um, 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 several institutions in, in the US and currently these documents are hosted by the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. So, so what I'm going to uh, discuss today is based on this, on this research and on these documents. Um, so I think, as, as, as you can also see on the uh, program, the topic of this panel is um, the events leading to the Anfa, right? And, and I think as, as uh, Professor Hardy and, and Professor uh, Benjo mentioned in, at the beginning, genocide doesn't happen out of the blue, right? Usually in most cases, genocide is an outcome of long processes of marginalization and persecution and, and intimidation. Um, and this was certainly the case of the of, of Anfal, right? Um, now, um, the, the efforts to manipulate and to destroy Kurdish identity um, have taken place since the early days of Iraqi independence, I think, uh, but certainly since the early days of the Republic in uh, 1958. But I think that I, th I think it's safe to say that the Ba'ath government really, really mastered the endeavors to to try and destroy not just not not just the Kurdish people physically, but also Kurdish um, Kurdish identity, Kurdish unity, right? The sense of Kurdish um, uh, national identity. Um, now, I think we've all been exposed. We've we've all heard about. Um, Arabization attempts, the uh, Arabization campaign, the you know the, the suffocation of Kurdish identity by by the Ba'ath regime and by the different um, uh, Republican governments. But what I wish to talk about today is um, uh, one aspect of of, of Ba'athist attempt 
to manipulate and and um, and break Kurdish identity, which I, I think hasn't received much attention. And this is the subject that I'm focusing on today is the way the Ba'ath government used the pro-government militias, right? The, the Josh, um, as a way, as a way to, um, to manipulate and, and, and divide and destroy um, Kurdish identity. Now, um, the, the, the Josh, and, and I'm using this, um, this derogatory term Josh um, just out of convenience, right? I mean, uh, the government has many different, the, the, sorry, the, the Ba'ath government had different terms for these militias, but um, uh, they will, uh, um, they will also re refer to them as, as the, the Josh by, by, by other Kurds. Now, the, the Josh, they did get, they did gain some attention, right? They did gain some scholarly att uh, attention, primarily because of their role in the violence, because of their participation in, uh, in the unfold. But there's much more, um, there's much more to know and to, le to learn about these militias. And there haven't been much, I, th I haven't encountered much research on the participation of Josh in, 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 um, in violence, on, on, on the subject of collaboration with the Ba'ath government. I wonder if it has to do more with the lack of, um, uh, with the lack of resources or because of the sensitivities of the subject. Um, but I've been trying to do that. And what, what I argue today in this presentation and what I've been arguing in my research um, is that um, these, these pro-government militia, right, the Josh, um, they, the, the existence was not just about um, violence. It was not just to serve as auxiliaries to the Iraqi security forces. What I argue is that the Ba'ath government saw the militias as a strategic tool in dividing the Kurdish population, in breaking Kurdish identity and dividing the Kurdish population. Um, and in many ways, I think this was, um, uh, and, and I might be making a controversial statement here, but I think that the use of the militias to break Kurdish society was even more crucial than, than using them for military purposes, right? For tactical purposes in, in, um, in the field. Um, so um, in other words, I try to argue that, that Saddam Hussein and the Ba'ath regime organized, armed, and funded the, the Josh militias because they believed that through organizing and recruiting these militias, um, they could enhance um, tribal, uh, geographic, and, and even sectarian or, or uh, religious identities among the populations in Kurdistan, again, as a way to break and destroy Kurdish identity. Now, um, if, if the Kurds, if the Kurds or, or, the, popula or the, the communities in Kurdistan fight each other, they won't fight Baghdad, right? So it is, in some way, it's a classic divide and rule strategy um, that was, you know, it was, it was it's, it's very typical of occupying forces. It was very typical, the colonial powers had used it before the Ba'ath regime. Um, and, and in a sense, the Ba'ath embraced this colonial set of mind and applied it to the Kurdish, um, to, to its counterinsurgency operations against the Kurdish nationalists. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to elaborate a bit more about it. The recruitment of Kurdish auxiliaries, right, of Kurdish collaborators, Kurdish militiamen, um, to fight along government forces against the against the against other Kurds, it did not start with Saddam Hussein, right? I mean, we know, for example, that Abdel Karim Qasem um, famously recruited Kurdish tribes that 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 you know had um, uh, rivalries. For example, with, with uh, the Bazani tribe or with other tribes that supported the, uh, the Kurdish uh, nationalist movement. So we know that Qasem recruited um, these, these um, 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 militias as well already very early in the 1960s. 
Now, um, Kasim, Kasim codenamed his fighters uh, Fusan. And his successors, right, the, the Arif brothers, they, they also uh, continue this practice of recruiting tribes ad hoc to fight the, the Kurdish nationalists. But when the Ba'ath came to power, they adopted this practice of recruiting you know, irregulars, of recruiting uh, tribes. Um, and what they did is they systemized it and they almost regularized it. So first of all, the Ba'ath authorities increased the number of recruits of, uh, of, 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 um, um, of these, militia, uh, these militias to, to tens and even hundreds of thousands of fighters at their peak, right? I think that at their peak, the, the, the number of fight, according to some estimations, uh, uh, I think the number of recruits almost reached 100,000 fighters, if I'm not mistaken. But they increased. So if under the Qasim and the Arefs, there were only a few thousands of fighters under the Ba'ath regime, especially in the, 19, in the late 1970s, uh, early 1980s, the number of the Josh really um, increased increased dramatically. Um, uh, uh, these recruits, right, they, they were um, uniformed, they were armed, um, and they were even salaried. Some of them actually received um, some, some salaries. And during the Iran-Iraq war, many Kurdish men could actually choose to serve in, in, the, in these militias instead of being sent to the front, right? So you can see that there was, I mean, this is quite an important incentive. Instead of being sent to fight against Iran, you could actually serve in your, um, near your town in order uh, to, you know, to serve near your family. Um, so, so, so the government clearly had an interest in recruiting these men. And they even, I mean, they, they, also, they also renamed them. So, so they were not Fusan anymore. Uh, they were actually now organized uh, into what was often referred to as the Afwaja uh, Defense and Watery, or the uh, National Defense Battalions. There were sometimes other names used to describe them, uh, these units, and there were also subunits. Uh, but, but the point is that the government really tried to make this into something more organized, more, more regular. Now, perhaps the most important factor in the formation of these battalions is at, at least uh, from, from my perspective, from my, from my research perspective, was their structure and their organization. These units were usually organized according to their to communal lines, right? Many of these units were organized according to their tribe, to the um, to their tribal affiliation, and um, their commanders or, or mustasha usually came, usually had a leading position in the tribe, right? So you can say that this form of recruitment uh, enhanced tribal identity. Uh, but it was not just tribal affiliation that served as the basis for the organization, because the Ba'ath authorities also invested extensively in forming battalions based on ethnic and religious identity. They particularly tried, they put, they put a lot of emphasis on recruiting, um, on, on forming uh, special Yazidi companies or Yazidi militias. Um, and these, um, uh, these, oh, these, these um, Yazidi companies or Asaraya um, al-Yazidiya, um, they often served as auxiliaries to the Afwaj, to the, to the uh, larger um, to the battalions. Uh, and, and you also had two command, uh, you also had two command battalions in, uh, in Kirkuk, and there were some attempts to create Shabak and Assyrian militias, but uh, the impression I got from the documents, from the archives, is that these were less, somewhat less successful. These attempts were less successful. Now, more importantly, it's, it's clear how the Ba'athist bureaucracy, right, the Ba'athist authorities, enhanced divisions among the Kurds by using these militias. Now, anyone who is slightly familiar with the Ba'ath discourse and the Ba'ath history in the 1970s would, you, would know that in, in officially, right, in theory, the Ba'ath rejected tribalism and sectarianism and everyone is Iraqi and everyone is um, Arab. Or, yeah, they recognized the Kurds as a nationalist 
movement, but but they, they you know they um, officially there was no you know they, they came out against tribalism and sectarianism. We know that in practice this wasn't really the case, of course, and everyone knew everyone knew you know to which particular group the, the other you know a, a person belonged. But the point is that officially the, the, the Ba'ath did not recognize tribalism and sectarianism, right? Government documents, um, official Ba'ath documents, for example, documents about uh, Ba'ath party membership, they didn't mention, um, they didn't mention um, um, tribal affiliation. They didn't mention sectarian or religious background. Uh, sometimes they didn't mention ethnicity because again, the Ba'ath did officially recognize the Kurds as a nationalist group. Um, but in the case of the, 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 um, the archives contain thousands of documents, I think thousands of documents, or certainly hundreds of documents of militia recruits, right? Um, and these documents, the, the documents about Josh actually did specify the um, tribal affiliation. They did specify the, um, the religious affiliation. So you will, or sectarian affiliation. So for example, if you had a Yazidi recruit, it would specify this is a Yazidi or um, this is a, uh, a Yazidi recruit. And they would also specify the ethnicity. It could be Arab or Kurd, um, or, or, or you know, they, they would describe, for example, the Shabak as either Kurd uh, or Arab of Shabak faith, uh, things like that. But the point is that you know, the, Ba'ath, the, the Ba'ath authorities did uh, feel, felt very comfortable about actually specifying these um, these dimensions when when it came to the militia recruits. And what I what, what I'm suggesting is that th this is a very strong indication to the fact that these that the the, the Ba'ath government that Saddam Hussein saw these militias as a way to divide and break the Kurdish nationalist movement. Now, um, in fact, this, this strategy actually did achieve some of its goals for some part of the time at least, because we, we have to remember that the Peshmerga and the Kurdish nationalists did invest their energy, some of their energy, in fighting these collaborators. We have, you know, we have, um, um, the, there are many evidence for the fact that um, um, the, the Kurdish nationalists retaliated against tribes that joined the, 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 um, the, uh, the militias, right? Um, now, by the way, by, and I think it's very important to stress it when we talk about these militias, it has to be remembered that these collaborators, some, sometimes they joined out of greed or because they received weapons or because of you know, tribal feuds, but in some cases, you know, these people actually, they, they were pressured by the government um, into joining these militias. They, they, they didn't have, um, they didn't have too much choice, right? Um, in any case, in any case, it did, you know, during the 1970s, 1980s, uh, there were rifts within the Kurdish, with, uh, you know, among the Kurds. Um, and I, I think this could also explain why some of these militias actually participated in, in the M5, because, because the rifts that this recruitment created was, was in, they were very deep. Okay, so um, to conclude, because I think I'm, I'm running out of time, um, the recruitment of pro-government militias was a precursor to the Anfal in that it indicated the, the Ba'ath government's desire to tear apart Kurdish identity, right? And, and again, to some degree, it was successful. Um, if I can use this to reflect on more contemporary affairs, I think most of you have probably heard about the, the village guards or the Kordula that the Turkish government um, has been uh, employing against um, against the PKK. Um, and I think that you know the lesson from from the pre and final period in Iraq should be an important um, indication as to how such system of militia recruitment can become can can be the path. Toward, um, toward the evolution of, of, of um, extreme violence. So um, I will finish on that note. Sorry, Ibrahim, I, I, I can't hear you. 
Well, thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, important topic. Uh, the topic is interesting and uh, few have written on this subject. Uh, the authorities in Iraq have benefited from the recruitment of some Kurdish clans to divide the Kurdish society and uh, at the same time to uh, fight the Kurdish movement. In theory, Ba'athists were saying something, but in practice, they were saying uh, something else totally. Uh, the important thing is that uh, they relied on the rule of divide and rule. Uh, they divided the Kurdish society into categories for the purpose of uh, implementing the policy of Arabization and hegemony of the uh, people. So anyway, thank you again. Um, I will um, welcome uh, uh, Kak Nabaz. He will uh, talk to us about Hannah Arendt, Ba'athism and Anfal. Uh, everyone knows Hannah Arendt and uh, her interesting uh, story. So please Kak Nabaz, uh, welcome to your presentation. <clears throat> uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am glad to see you. And many thanks for organizers uh, this wonderful conference, Dr. Uh, Ibrahim and uh, Dr. Bahar and Dr. Uh, Stephen. Um, as uh, Dr. Uh, Ibrahim said, uh, my presentation is about uh, Hannah Arendt uh, Basism and uh, Anfal. Uh, in my presentation, uh, I will uh, mainly focus on uh, how uh, Ba'as as a totalitarian uh, regime justified uh, Anfal against uh, the Kurds. Um, Hannah Arendt, in uh, her theory of uh, totalitarianism, uh, observed three elements, uh, namely ideology, terror, and total domination. Uh, to explain uh, the link between um, totalitarianism and uh, genocide. So uh, in uh, her footsteps, I, uh, I argue that uh, Ba'ath ideology, terror and uh, total domination uh, led uh, to unfall uh, in uh, Iraq. So um, I have divided my presentation in, into three parts. Uh, first, I like to um, to give you an overview about uh, Kurdish situation in uh, Iraq since its creation, uh, it is um, creation as a post uh, post uh, nation uh, post colonial nation state, uh, and uh, then uh, I focus on uh, Ba'ath ideology uh, ideology justification for Anfal campaign. And second, I will move uh, move on uh, on Ba'ath terror, and finally, uh, I'll consider uh, Ba'ath total domination and uh, Ba'ath uh, solutions for uh, the Kurdish problem in uh, Iraq. So uh, let's start uh, with a Kurdish situation in Iraq. Uh, as uh, all you know, uh, Iraq is a creation uh, country, a constructed country. Uh, before World War I, uh, it doesn't exist, uh, and after the war, Iraq uh, became a British mandate. Uh, Iraq was uh, a multinational, multi-religion uh, country. Um, so uh, Britain had to manage this diversity uh, on, in, the, in the one country uh, where there were conflicts and revolt against uh, the British uh, mandate at the time. Uh, and uh, from the beginning, the Kurds disagreed uh, with the annexation of uh, Southern Kurdistan or uh, Mosul Vilayet uh, in Ottomanian uh, terms to the new uh, country of Iraq and accordingly um, revolted against uh, the British forces. Uh, but uh, the British responded to uh, the Kurdish demands for uh, independence with brutality. Uh, 
and Winston Churchill, uh, who was a uh, Secretary of State at uh, that time, defended the legitimacy of using poison gas uh, against the Kurdish uh, rebels. And he says, I am strongly in favor of using poisoned gas against uncivilized uh, tribes. Uh, it would spare uh, lively terror. And of course, uh, by uncivilized uh, tribes, he means uh, the uh, Kurdish rebels. So uh, chemical attacks against Kurdish people by uh, British forces in the 1920s uh, caused a great impact on uh, Iraq's politics uh, in the future. So as Douglas uh, proposes a connection or a link between uh, uh, Churchill and Kimikal Ali or uh, Hassan uh, Ali Hassan Al Majid, and in the same manner, uh, Anderson and Stanfield suggest that perhaps the uh, extensive British use uh, of chemical weapons against uh, rebels Kurdish tribes during the uh, 1920s uh, provided the model for uh, the Anfal uh, campaign. Um, building a nation state in uh, plural societies by force and as Britain does in uh, Iraq uh, often results in destruction, pluralism uh, and provide a prelude for genocide uh, as we have seen against the Kurdish in um, the Anfal campaign. Uh, since a nation state's goal uh, is creating a single national identity, uh, this goal uh, usually uh, adopted by force, uh, use of force, and often uh, causes forced assimilation uh, or physical annihilation uh, of minorities, uh, cultures, or uh, languages. Uh, as Ojalan says, uh, the nation state in its original form uh, I'm at uh, the monopolization of all social processes, uh, diversity and plurality had to be fought and uh, an approach that led into uh, assimilation and uh, genocide. Uh, now uh, let's move on uh, Ba'as ideology uh, and uh, the Anfal uh, campaign. In 1968, uh, the Ba'ath Party took power uh, in Iraq for the second time by uh, a military uh, coup d'etat. Uh, this coup d'etat, however, is not only a regime change. Uh, Ba'ath ideology and party radically changed the Iraqis uh, political, economic, uh, and social formation. The Ba'ath uh, was... Uh, an Arab nationalist party which had uh, an eternal message, uh, one Arab nation with an immortal uh, mission and based its ideology uh, on pan-Arabism. So pan-Arabism is crucial for uh, the Ba'ath regime because of its requirements for uh, establishment uh, one Arab uh, state. The Ba'ath movement attempted to the unity of all Arab um, in one state. By the late 1970s, uh, to be an Iraqi citizen was to be a Ba'ath party member. So for Ba'ath, the state is only an instrument uh, to reach Ba'ath's goals, which are the Ba'athification of not merely the Iraqi society, uh, but also the whole uh, Arab and Islamic uh, world and uh, achieve uh, total domination. Therefore, a united Arab Ba'athist nation uh, is the full realization of uh, Ba'athism. So Ba'athi nation is uh, based on faith or uh, Iman. Uh, according to the Ba'ath ideology, the quality of being an Arab uh, is resting on faith in the message of Arabism. 
the moment when uh, bigness to uh, then um, this or her arachnid uh, takes place, and in fact, uh, for a Kurd is um, to deny his or her Kurdishness. So from this, uh, we we can uh, understand how um, the phenomena of uh, Josh. Uh, raised and which uh, Jan talked about in uh, his presentation. So um, since Josh is a person or is a Kurt who denied uh, his or her Kurdishness and uh, believed in Arabism uh, and struggle for uh, Arab nation. The best idea of faith or Iman uh, and blind uh, and questioning of Arabism explicitly uh, derived from uh, Islamic tradition. Faith and uh, myth-making uh, are part and parcel of uh, the Ba'ath ideology. So the Ba'ath myths are derived from Islamic and uh, Arabic uh, traditions. For the Ba'ath ideologue, uh, Michel Aflak, nationalism is uh, love, which carries uh, the Arab uh, spirit. Such an idea, according to him, uh, cannot be imported from the West, but it lies in the Arabic and Islamic traditions. For the Ba'ath ideology, Islam represents uh, the total unity of uh, the Arabs, and it is a significant part of the Arab nationality, language, and literature. In Michel Aflaq's view, Arabism is a body whose spirit is Islam. According to Ba'ath ideology, Islam as a revolutionary uh, Arab movement reappeared and renewed with uh, Arabism. So the folk link uh, illustrated that why the Ba'ath regime used Islam against the Kurds and adopted the surah of Quran uh, for justification of Kurdish uh, annihilation in the Anfal campaign in 1988. The Ba'ath regime used and adopted uh, that uh, term, the term to extremate the Kurds because they uh, did not believe in Ba'athism rather than uh, in Islam. Ba'ath want to provide uh, Islamic justification for the campaign and on the other hand, to put the, uh, the punishment described in that surah, uh, the surah of Anfal into practice against uh, the Kurds. In Ba'athist ideology, Islam could play a major role to regulate different uh, ethnic groups and minorities in uh, one Arab uh, country. So Ba'athists consider considers that whoever speaks Arabic or lives on Arab territory is uh, an Arab. And uh, also for Ba'ath, uh, Iraq is part of uh, Arab's homeland and Iraqi people are part of the Arab nation. As Ba'ath's uh, constitution stated that only Arabism or only Arab could exist in the uh, Arab nation and all other ethnic groups, uh, example, Kurds, uh, must be assimilated and melted in uh, one crucible of Arab nation. As a result, uh, a non Arab group uh, shall be expelled from the Arab homeland if uh, could not be uh, assimilated. From this, uh, it follows that Ba'ath with his uh, pan-Arab ideology views Kurdish national movement uh, as a threat to a united Iraq and uh, it is pan-Arab uh, unification projects. Therefore, for Ba'athists, uh, Kurdish support to another party except uh, Ba'ath is unacceptable. Clearly, by supporting uh, 
other organizations accepted by as party, Kurdish are no longer uh, involved in the definition of the people whom define it by uh, the Ba'as ideology. In Ba'as ideology, the people are identical with Arab nation. The two understood as uh, an indistinguishable uh, collective noun. Due to the Ba'asist Arab nationalist ideology, Kurdish were excluded and represented them as a potential threat uh, since Kurdish were an obstacle uh, to the Arab unity. So Kurdish, according to the Ba'as ideology, are a problem, um, untrue, and danger too. These qualities bring about um, increasing the levels of Kurdish threat. Um, as a consequence, the problem must be solved, the untrue must be silenced, and the danger must be uh, annihilated. Every totalitarian system like Ba'as uh, needs internal and external a threat to build uh, their ideologies and uh, policies on them. For instance, uh, in the Third Reich, uh, the enemy was defined in racial terms, um, a Jewish uh, threat. Whereas in Stalin's regime, uh, the enemy was defined in class terms, um, bourgeois threat. Likewise, in uh, the Ba'as regime, the enemy was defined um, in terms of uh, national um, Kurdish uh, threat. So all totalitarian regimes use the same tool of uh, pseudo-ideological justifications for privation, entire nations, and uh, other groups uh, of the right to live. As a matter of fact, uh, there is a link between uh, radically evil principles and radically evil actors. Since radically evil principles uh, always come first, uh, they are provided and justified by ideologies and then acted upon. Uh, ideologies became a, a basic structure for genocide. Uh, as a result, ideological principles guide uh, genocide, although not every uh, ideology can supply principles for uh, methodical genocide, but ideology guides almost all cases of uh, genocide as uh, principles for action. This leads me to uh, my uh, second point uh, about uh, terror. Uh, terror is a necessary uh, ingredient of a totalitarian regime because uh, the totalitarian state concentrates on uh, an ideology uh, instead of an interest. Uh, ideology depends on two uh, pillars. First, uh, unconditional belief uh, in uh, the truth of the ideology. Uh, second, uh, terror. Uh, which is an organized uh, practice of violence in order to uh, extend fear among uh, people. The two pillars are uh, interdependent. The Ba'as regime, uh, as a totalitarian movement, uh, attempted to turn Iraqi's uh, society into uh, a mass society because the raw material uh, of totalitarianism is uh, the mass. As Hannah Arendt says, totalitarian movements are mass organizations of atomized, isolated individual. Compared with all other parties and movements, their most conspicuous uh, external characteristic is their demand for total and restricted and conditional and an alterable loyalty of the individual member. Such, such loyalty can be expected only from the completely isolated human being who without any other social ties to family, friends, comrades, derives his uh, sense of having a place in the world only 
from his belonging to a movement, his uh, membership in the party. And Ba'as uh, tried to um, turn Iraqi society uh, like uh, this as um, Arendt uh, explains. And fear and uh, faith uh, are the most important elements in Ba'as ideology. Unlike other Iraqi tyrannies, Ba'as wants to control and dominate not only the political realm, but also creates an atmosphere of paranoid distrust between friends, colleagues, and even family members. It follows that all uh, forms of organization not directly under uh, the Ba'as control uh, have been wiped out. The public is atomized and broken up. Society has been silenced and uh, depolitized. Fear has transformed uh, the Iraqi society and becomes a cement to hold the whole Iraqi body uh, politics together. Uh, in Ba'at view, even using chemical weapons uh, is a way to terrorize and bind the society together. A kind of fear uh, that makes people careful of what they say, even in front of uh, their children. The world's uh, half ears comes from this distrust and uh, fear. The Ba'ath regime uh, endeavored to break down all non-political bonds because afraid uh, that such bonds might uh, raise a demand against uh, the party. As a consequence, by 1980s, the Iraqi society, the Ba'ath party state and civil society um, turned it into a great uh, single formless frightened mass. The result was uh, a true uh, regime of uh, terror. As Arendt says, total terror is the essence of totalitarian government. So totalitarian uh, terror and genocide turn into a close and strong relation because all types of totalitarian ideologies and regimes are constructed through a similar uh, ideology and as a consequence, uh, totalitarian regimes uh, committed genocide and uh, ethnic uh, cleanizing. Finally, uh, let's consider Ba'ath's total domination and uh, the solutions of uh, Kurdish problem. Hannah Arendt in uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem claimed that the Nazi regime in uh, offers three uh, solutions for a uh, Jewish problem in uh, Germany. First, exclusion, second, uh, concentration, and final solution, uh, killing. In, the, in a similar manner, Ba'ath regime offers three uh, solutions for the Kurdish problem in uh, Iraq. Firstly, uh, Arabization process and deportationists. Uh, secondly, resettlement uh, in the concentration campus, uh, and finally, uh, final solution, uh, annihilation, the UNFAO uh, campaign. First, the Arabization process and uh, deportation is the Ba'ath regime attempted to resettle all the Kurds uh, from uh, provinces of Mosul, Diyala, and Kirkuk in order to uh, depopulate and change the demography of these rich oil uh, areas as a part of uh, Arabization process. So the Basque party policy was uh, mass Kurdish deportations to the southwestern uh, desert of Iraq. Kurdish families were accumulated and transported uh, by army trackers to uh, desert campus or to uh, Arab villages um, where they were settled in small groups. Uh, these places were designed for uh, the Kurdish deportations uh, by the higher committee for uh, the fires of uh, the north 
and commanded by Saddam Hussein. Second, the uh, resettlement in the concentration campus from uh, 1970s to uh, late 1980s, uh, the Ba'ath government completely destroyed Kurdish villages uh, 15 to uh, 20 kilometers wide along with the Turkish and Iranian borders. The villagers were relocated and taken to concentration uh, campus. Uh, altogether, almost 5,000 Kurdish villages uh, approximately 80 persons have been ringed and uh, their inhabitants uh, banished. Furthermore, the town of uh, Kaladza, about 16 kilometers from Iranian border, had been wiped out uh, and uh, its settlers were taken to uh, concentration camps. In a like manner, the town of Halabja had been flattened to the ground and its inhabitants were taken to uh, a new town uh, or complex houses which created by the uh, Ba'ath government and uh, named it a new Saddam city, Halabja. This task, the time you have two more minutes, okay? Um, oh, okay, almost I uh, finished. Um, so, uh, to conclude, or in, in short, uh, I would say the Ba'ath Party, as a totalitarian movement, attempted through its ideology to turn the Iraqi society into a shapeless and frightened mass because the mass is crucial for uh, totalitarian regimes. Uh, by its fear and terror, the Ba'ath uh, regime attempted to reach uh, total domination and uh, solution Kurdish, uh, the Kurdish problem in uh, Iraq. Since the Ba'ath as a totalitarian government, uh, terror and uh, fear uh, are at its very essence. Uh, it seems that the Kurdish uh, genocide or anti campaign uh, and uh, an inflation uh, in 1988 drive it from uh, Ba'ath totalitarian ideology, uh, terror, and uh, total domination. In any case, uh, in the Kurdish genocide uh, and fall, first, uh, the term Kurd was defined and uh, formed in Ba'ath ideology. Then uh, Caesar pro procedures were begun uh, after which the Kurds were concentrated in uh, concentration camps, uh, and finally it was decided to uh, completely destroy uh, Kurdish rural areas, particularly. Um, as a result, uh, there are three stages or steps in the uh, Anfal campaign, namely the definition of the Kurds, their concentration, and uh, their annihilation. Accordingly, Ba'athists must define the terms of Kurds before acting against them. Furthermore, they must isolate uh, the Kurds from the others before starting uh, the final solution, uh, annihilation uh, of them. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Imam Sanavas, for your uh, important uh, presentation. Um, Kaknebaz uh, talked to us a little about the founding of Iraq and the issues of annexation, the Mosul Wilayat to the new state, and the relationship of colonialism to this issue. He spoke about the behavior of colonialism and the bombing of the Kurds with chemical weapons for the first time. He also spoke elaborately about the Ba'ath ideology and the issue of the genocide process from Ba'athification to Arabization and genocide and its terror methods. Uh, anyway, thank you again, Maustanabaz. And we are going to uh, Dr. Kamal Aziz Katuli. 
uh, and he's the only topic about the failure Kurdis in this conference. And the few who focus on this DR Kurdish component. Uh, his uh, topic is uh, the first <coughs> Anfal operation taken place against Faili Kurdish in Iraq. The case of deportation and hostages taken of Iraq, Iraqi citizens, uh, mainly Faili Kurdish by Saddam Ba'ath regime between 1980 and 1989. Uh, Dr. Kamal. Please. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for the invitation, and thank, uh, thank you for organizing this very important conference on the issues of the, of the Kurdish nation and, and, and the people in the Middle East in, in general. Uh, I, I, I would like to thank especially the, Dr. Ibrahim, Dr. Bahar, and Dr. Mc, uh, McLaughlin, and uh, uh, Mr. Dixon. Uh, Dixon for organizing uh, this uh, conference. Uh, this this topic, uh, which I'm going to 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 speak about and highlight and inform, is involves uh, people from uh, southern uh, our Kurdish people from southern Kurdistan and. Uh, let me go to for my presentation, please. Yes. Now, uh, six months before the Iraq-Iran war and on the 4th of April, 1980, the Iraqi Saddam government embarked on a mass deportation of Iraqi citizens to Iran. The Red Cross uh, International estimates at the time that 100,000 people were deported in the first six months and in total approximate 1 million people were deported over the decade of 1980, uh, 1990. At the same time, thousands of relatives of the deportees were retained as hostages. The majority were subsequently deported and, and estimated uh, 4,000 of these hostages disappeared and until now their fate is unknown. Others uh, died either in prison or at the front, uh, at the front line in the Iraq-Iran war. Mainly, uh, many of them were used in Iraqi uh, chemical and biological warfare experiment. Now, uh, just to give you a little background of uh, the, the the Kurdish uh, the Kurdish pe uh, people and uh, the Persians and the Armenians are the rem the remnant or and the stock of the uh, Sumerians uh, in Mesopotamia in the Middle East in uh, what you call now Iraq Iran Syria Turkey and the rest of of the region. Uh, then this followed by the by the Meat uh, Empire, which covered uh, most of the Middle East, North Africa, all the way to uh, northern India. Then uh, the the Turk Turkmen Seljuks uh, came into into the the region from Xinjiang province in north uh, west of China in year 1030, and they. They, uh, they managed to, to take over and control many parts, starting from China all the way to the Middle East and, and parts of Europe. And from this uh, too, gradually they took over the, the, the Medes empire and established from it two new empires, uh, the Safavid, which is mainly in Iran now, uh, and uh, the Ottomani empire. And uh, from this, uh, the, followed by the, 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 the Western powers, they managed uh, to look and search into the region and uh, come up with a plan uh, to, to, to see how they could divide uh, the, the region and, uh, and control it. Uh, this is where, where the world uh, precious resources, mainly of oil and gas and minerals, 
and uh, for geopolitical reasons, uh, they they came up uh, and uh, managed uh, to to create a condition to create the first world war and uh, take out the, uh, the 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 Ottomans and and the and the and the Safavis uh, and come with a with a with a a secret uh, agreement which then. Uh, the Pravda in 19, uh, uh, 1917, November 1917, they actually published it. And uh, this was the Cyprus uh, Picos uh, agreement that to divide the Middle East uh, region uh, uh, to, to be able to control it and to exploit, uh, to control the people, to exploit his, his, his resources. Uh, Came up with a, with a with a policy of of divide and rule that they divided the region into uh, smaller, easily manipulated states, and and this policy actually has has been suc succeeded uh, in in bringing uh, governments, established government in the region, uh, in these countries, which is uh, employed. And brought by by, by the by this uh, by the powers uh, to follow their agenda, and and also at the same time uh, to put people uh, divide people according to this in new countries in new maps uh, according to their uh, religion and 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 ethnic background, and actually put them against each other and and create war and chaos. In the whole Middle East, and uh, and from that uh, building uh, to, to to implement these policies, they start to build military bases everywhere, and create the wars where they could be a good market to sell uh, weapons, and and at the same time to put the people of the of the west against the east, the people of the north against the south, uh, in, in in the whole in the whole world. And, and, and focus uh, these policies in the Middle East until now. And uh, from that, they, they were able to bring uh, the Saddam, who, who was Saddam Hussein, he was uh, in, the, in the 50s, a gangster actually in, the, in, in Iraq, was very well known. And, uh, and, uh, and the person who they brought from the gutter of the society and brought him up, in, uh, uh, they brought him back in 1968. Uh, 17th of July 1968, and gradually they made him a deputy president. Uh, when the, when Ahmed Hassan Bakr, his, his president, uh, to try to nationalize the Iraqi oil, then they uh, they tried to assassinate him through Saddam Hussein himself. After this, they managed to to to, to get Saddam into power, and uh, and uh, in 1979. And from that, they were pre 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 they, they now guarantee the, the the oil of Iraq through Saddam Hussein. Uh, this is after where, where they guaranteed uh, the oil uh, control uh, after the the signing of the pact with the Saudi uh, royal family with the King Faisal in 1974, and and this followed all the other uh, Gulf Arabic regions. And the only country left for them uh, have not been in, in control of their oil was was Iran, and from that they uh, they planned with Saddam and uh, and made them to to in, invade Iran in uh, in, in August 1980. This is to for for through Saddam Hussein to control the oil fields in in South. West of Iran, mainly in Abadan and and uh, Ahwaz uh, region, and from this, uh, the crisis of our 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 people actually uh, started, and they become a victim of of this war. Now, the the crimes of genocide, uh, ethnic cleansing, and uh, disappearance of hostages. The uh, the implemented Saddam Ba'athist regime genocide plan. War, where uprooting of Kurds from Iraq, internal and external forceful mass deportation, Arabization of Kurdish regions and areas, forceful 
change of Kurdish identity to Arabic, eliminating Kurdish identity, culture, history, and language, hostage taking and unfair operation of tens of thousands of young men, women, and children, and their uh, disappearance into mass grave. And this is actually first started with, the, with our Fadi Kurds, where, which are inhabiting uh, southern parts of Kurdistan in the, from, from south, from Kirkuk, all the way to, to the Persian Gulf, and then uh, uh, and from, from Babylon all the way to, to Hamadan. This is the areas which is uh, covered by our uh, Lur uh, uh, Fadi uh, Kurdish uh, people. And then in 1983-84, the, the genocide, uh, again, uh, again, the Anfal genocide against the 8,000 Barzani uh, uh, families, uh, this is followed in the Germian uh, region in 1987-88. That was the biggest Anfal operation campaign against our Kurdish people in Germian. This is from Kirkuk all the way down to, to the Diyala uh, province. And this has actually happened in front of the, the whole world. And we, we tried in, uh, uh, in, in Britain to, 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 to expose this and to show it to the world. And we wrote about it at the time. In, uh, in the British newspaper, but un unfortunately, is being muted, and 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 didn't they didn't allow the world to, to know about it at the time. The same thing uh, when uh, the use of chemical and biological weapons, thallium uh, poisoning and acid baths and execution, when Halabja being attacked again is being muted by the whole world uh, media, by the whole world. Uh, and we, we had to go and demonstrate and pickets in, in London and in, in Europe and many, many parts of the world. But, uh, but Saddam Hussein still was their man until, uh, uh, until he went to, uh, they sent actually, they sent him to Kuwait to bring uh, uh, what is money left in the pockets of the Gulf Arab, Arab countries after they drained them and involved them uh, to finance uh, the war, uh, Saddam Hussein's war uh, against Iran. The Iraqi failure course genocide by Saddam Ba'ath's regime. Uh, this is uh, ex points, the main points is external mass deportation, confiscation of all their belonging and uh, Iraqi citizenship documents, hostage taking, their disappearance and their fate is still unknown. Arabization of their towns, villages and homes until this minute is the Arabization taking, but. But, uh, and this is now in the form of ISIS, which is most of them are, are Baathist. Uh, Saddam, actually, there are Saddam's uh, 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 Baathists in the region uh, joined with, with, Arab, uh, with other Arabs uh, uh, from the surrounding uh, countries and, and, and from other nationalities. External deportation. On 4th of April, 1980, to 1990, approximately a million Iraqi citizens, mainly Fadi Kurds, and other Iraqi citizens. There were other Iraqi citizens, uh, uh, Armenians, even uh, Indians, uh, many many Arabs also. Uh, they 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 were they were deported. They they were taken from uh, over uh, all over Iraq and especially from Baghdad and the border towns. Uh, fa fam uh, these are actually the, some of the selected photos uh, which we obtained at the time. These are live picture of the families. Uh, uh, Sad uh, Saddam Hussein uh, regime without any, any warning. Uh, they uh, came into the, the houses of our families uh, in Baghdad, in the, in, the, in the border areas with no warning at nighttime, 15, 16 people uh, attacking coming into the houses and ordering in the, in the force of gun on their head, not allowing them to take anything or any of their belonging uh, and, 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 and put them in buses, in lorries, and they dump them onto the, uh, into, onto the border. This is my father who was, who was being invited on 7th of April, uh, just three days after the deportation started with the other businessmen into the House of Commerce in Baghdad on 7th of April, 1980. And they didn't know that was a trap of them, uh, for them. And then from there, 
They put them in buses, about 865 of them, whoever came into that meeting, all business, well-known business people of, of, of Baghdad mainly, and, and, uh, and, and, they, and they took them to the security intelligence service and headquarters in Baghdad. From there, they, they check everything with them. They confiscated whatever they had in their pocket and they put them back in other buses. And the same day, the same night, they dumped them onto Iraq, Iran border. And this is actually a photo of him uh, in the inside Iran uh, border. Many, many elderly people uh, been deported. Uh, people, uh, they, they didn't even have the, their shoes to be able to wear their shoes to go. They had to go through all this. The deportation commenced on 4th of April, March 1980, six months prior to the start of the Iraq-Iran war. And this is the important point that uh, this war with Iran was well planned, well, well planned years before. And we, the fairest victims of this war was our families, our, 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 our Pali uh, Kurdish people, and, and as I mentioned, other Iraqi citizens uh, to, to, to suffer from this war. Uh, when they, uh, and this is to make sure that anybody do not follow the, the Ba'athists or be, uh, become a member with them, and especially Saddam Hussein regime, they put a, a cross on them uh, to, to be deported outside the country into Iran. The, the deportees were accused of being Iranian origin while they all have Iraqi passports, Iraqi identity cards. This top secret decision of the of the de deportations and hostage right. taking has been taken by highest authority in Iraq and by direct order from Saddam Hussein. Top secret decree uh, uh, number six six six. You look at that that number <laughs> decree uh, by itself is it does, it doesn't look good. Issued in uh, in 1980 early 1980 and signed by Saddam himself and with copies of all these documents. Many young children have been uh, deported, some uh, along, uh, along, some with their family. This child been put in, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a hand luggage and been deported alone, separated from his family and found by the Iranian uh, soldiers. Uh, elderly people have been deported alone, many elderly people, and these are again, they'll be found uh, uh, in the, on the border. Many disabled people, blind people, dis mentally disabled, deported uh, alone. Uh, this lady whom is a di distance relative, we know her, her brother was the goalkeeper of the Iraqi national team. Uh, and uh, and uh, when they were deported in the route, her daughter, uh, she, she, she took uh, a little distance from them, and from that, she escaped uh, a landmine and got killed. Therefore, they, they send the, our deported people through landmines to, to get killed. This lady, uh, she her husband taken a, a home, and she was deported, like many other thousands, alone. All of the belongings of the deportees, properties, business, money in the bank, and Iraqi documents were confiscated. Sorry, I am hearing a noise. Yeah. Can you meet these people? Can you meet them, Kak uh, I'm trying. Yeah, I am sorry. Um, yes, sir, I will mute them. Yeah, just mute them, whoever they are, please. Thanks. Uh, and Iraqi citizenship document were, were, were confiscated. This is uh, our house in Baghdad, uh, which is confiscated, the whole house. Uh, the, and many, many thousands of our people, their properties uh, has been confiscated. Uh, if they were Iranian, uh, if they were Iranian, how uh, how uh, uh, these our people have Iraqi passports? And this is a passport from the Kingdom time. Also, they were holding and they were uh, they were deported. When they were deported in Iran, some of them managed uh, the from the Iranian uh, authorities to to give them a green ID card, uh, and it's written in it they are Iraqi citizens. Uh, uh, in the, on, on, on this card. 
about 5,000 of the remaining Fehli deportees are still living in refugees in, uh, uh, in camps in Iran, in, in Azna and Juhrum camps, mostly now left in, in, in Juhrum camps. These refugees are still waiting on the Iraqi government to Uh, the, the Iranian authorities, they were overwhelmed with these tens and tens of thousands of uh, Iraqi deportees uh, dumped uh, onto them uh, uh, into Iran and the war started. Then, then uh, the Iranian in the other side of the border who are also our people, also Kurdish, they become uh, refugees themselves. Therefore, they had from us, from Iraq, about 1 million internal uh, refugees, their own refugees, from the war, about 2 million. And then when the Afghan war, war started, millions of Afghanis started to pour, about 6 million of Afghanis uh, poured on Iran. And they were busy uh, uh, fighting the world in that time, uh, fighting Saddam Hussein and, and most of the world uh, supporting him uh, in that war. This is the, the Azna Khan picture. Now, hostage taking to silence and they said this to, to our families they were, when they were deporting them, uh, to silence pro, uh, protest members of each uh, family of deportees were detained as, as hostages. Uh, members of, the, of our families been taken as hostages in front of the, uh, of, of the families. And, uh, and they said to them, these are our share. We keep them here. If you speak anything uh, uh, outside the country against us, uh, we will kill uh, your sons. Approximately one detainee for every uh, 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 10 uh, the, uh, deportees. These hostages were mainly men uh, 16 uh, to 40 age, but they were much older uh, also been taken uh, and, and, and much, much younger. Uh, they were arrested. Uh, this is my own brother, Jamal, uh, who been uh, taken uh, as a hostage and he was doing his military service uh, after he finished university and uh, he'd been taken hostage two weeks after uh, my family's uh, deportation. Uh, this, uh, these are my cousins uh, been, been taken hostage in 1982 actually uh, and they, they are in, in, in the Qalat Salman prison in 1985 uh, and, and they, they were uh, allowed at the time to visit the remaining relative. Actually, they went and these two ladies, they were visiting them at that time before their disappearance. Uh, Mr. Sadiq Al-Kamali, uh, I'm just showing you examples, who was actually doing his postgraduate studies in, 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 in London. And he just went for to visit his family uh, for a visit. And when he went there, his family actually, they, they, they were in the process of deportation. And, uh, and, and they got him and they and, uh, took him as a hostage. Uh, uh, these are uh, these hostages, uh, this is photographs of hostages who actually they were uh, serving in the Iraqi army. Some, some actually uh, serving, uh, some actually recruited for, for their national service. Uh, okay, if they were Iranian origin and they were not Iraqis, in the Iraqi law, uh, for military service, a foreign national is not allowed to serve in the Iraqi army. How they could be uh, non-Iraqis then? Uh, uh, this is another. Uh, this is a, a, a child actually being taken at the time. Uh, the photos we have we have hundreds of photos of of, of the hostages uh, and uh, who are uh, disappeared uh, till now. Uh, no fate of them. We don't know anything about their fate. The hostages were imprisoned in various prisons and transported between prisons. First of all, uh, most of them ended in Abu Ghraib prison from the period of April 1980 to December 1984, and then to Qal'at al-Salman uh, in, in, in the desert, uh, uh, south of uh, Samawa, nearer to the Saudi border, uh, from 1984 to 1986, uh, uh, where uh, the, which is the main uh, prison where the hostages be kept. For at least 4,000 of Fehli hostages, their fate is still unknown. Uh, they, they've been taken, as, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, to, this is up actually Abu Ghraib prison in Baghdad. 
This, this photo has been taken after Saddam bin toppled in 2003. Uh, uh, people people speak, uh, started to speak in 2003, the abuses and things by, by, by the Americans and the uh, soldiers and things to, to prisoners in Abu Ghraib. We were, we were trying to highlight our hostages in Abu Ghraib prison from 1980 onward and been hushed up. They were no, the, the world media, they completely hushed up. They, they, they were not highlighted. And then, and then after Saddam bin toppled, everybody started to speak about, uh, about this prison, Abu Ghraib, uh, Abu Ghraib prison. Uh, the hostages, uh, uh, our hostages, my brother and the rest of them in Abu Ghraib prison, after a year, they, 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 uh, they went on to a riot in Abu Ghraib prison. They, they, they broke the, the, these, these actual metal cells and they went into the ground of, of, of the prison demanding uh, their fate, w why they are here. And they wanted to see it the highest authority. They, they got, sorry, I don't know who that came in. Uh, yeah, I don't know too. Sorry, you did talk. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, they, they, uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, half brother Barzanti Kriti came with a helicopter with 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 with, with his uh, uh, bodyguards and and spoke to them. Uh, he said, "Listen, you are here as uh, as, as prisoners uh, of the Iraq Iran war." Uh, you are hostages here, and uh, you, your fate and your release will depend on the end of the Iraq Iran war. If the war finishes next week, we release you next week. If next month, next month, next year, next year, next 10 years, next 10 years. Therefore, the best thing I could do for you is to go back to, 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 your, uh, to your prison cells and, and I could uh, try to improve uh, your prison conditions. That's all. And they write it and they insulted him, and then. Uh, a, a big fight uh, taking place, and after that, uh, uh, my my uh, my my after that on. Uh, let me go back to that, uh, to the date. After after this riot and on the on the 14th of July, a list came of about 750 to Abu Ghraib prison. My brother was among them. And they they call them out, uh, pretending they're going to 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 release them and 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 deport them. But actually, they they have not uh, they have not uh, they they disappeared from that time till now. Obviously, we didn't know uh, at the time. We only got all this information when we saw uh, release hostages from nine, 1991 onward. This is the prison of. Uh, this is the prison of uh, Qal'at Salman in the, in, in the south of Samawa in the Ar'ar -Ar desert near uh, the border. And uh, this is inside uh, the, the prison. Uh, the, uh, yeah, this kind of prison, you could see, you, uh, this has been supposed to be built as military uh, uh, bases for, for Saddam's army. But they were converted into concentration camps, into prisons, and they made models of them in every city in Iraq. You, when, if you go to Duhok, you will see it. In Erbil, you will see it. And obviously, this is in, 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 in Samawa. And many, many parts of Iraq, exactly copycat of this. You, uh, uh, you could see it in Soleimania and many, many parts of, of the country. Uh, yeah, this is inside the, the, the prison. Uh, this is where the hostages actually, this, these are the hostages kept it from 1984, 86 in, in, in Qal'at Salman prison. Doctor, uh, Doctor Kamal, you have one minute, please. Uh, one minute? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if you, can you give me five minutes just to go through the things? Yeah. Uh, we five are minutes, down, please. So if you just... Okay. Yeah, this is a ex hostage, a former hostage, Mr. Hussein Abbas, who actually managed after nine years in detention to go abroad. These are the, the photos of the other hostage, Qal'at Salman prison. Uh, uh, we, we managed uh, in 1993, we have decided to establish a committee for release 
of hostages and detainees in Iraq uh, by the help of uh, every uh, single uh, British political party. They send their uh, uh, representative MPs, NGOs, uh, uh, relative of the hostages and establish a committee. We, we, we managed to come up with a campaign uh, to start uh, to have a, a forum uh, for, the, for the hostages and send it to the relative, uh, filled it, and, uh, and we managed to get uh, 938 names of the hostages. The campaigns uh, uh, and uh, the campaign and international organization contacted, uh, contacted Red Cross International, uh, Amnesty International. Obviously, uh, because, uh, because of the time, I would like to speak about uh, what actually happened with these organizations and what they have done, but we don't have time, I'll just go through them. International Court of Justice, International Criminal Court, European Committee on Human Rights, uh, uh, UN Human Rights, Mr. Van der Stoel, uh, Resolution 688 in 1991, uh, and, and followed by 100, uh, uh, sorry, 1441. Uh, they said that Mr. Van der Stoel, I said, well, you cannot do something for our hostages. He said, this resolution being put they have no mandate, they have no teeth. It's just a resolution. They, it's not the, like the one they, they give the mandate for, for, the, for, for the British and the American troops to go into, uh, uh, into Iraq and, 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 and get Saddam out of, uh, out of power. British government, parliament, uh, uh, union, trade unions, uh, uh, the US government, Senate, all EU, US, uh, Russia, China, Eastern European countries, Islamic conference, Islamic countries, uh, the Arabic countries, organization, uh, human, uh, human rights. And these are the, 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 the campaigns which we held in, in, in UK uh, and, and also managed to get 238 British MPs to sign the motion, which is, which is first put by Mr. George Galloway and then by, by Baroness uh, Emma Nicholson. Uh, this is a meeting uh, where uh, Daphne Parish is one of the founder of the committee of uh, release. She was a former hostage in, in Iraq, and uh, and uh, and uh, she helped in the campaign. Uh, uh, also, uh, this is ba Baroness Emma Nicholson. At that day, we tried to put that motion, uh, which which she put to the British Parliament uh, after getting uh, two, uh, 238 MPs actually uh, signing it. Uh, we, uh, the, the trial of Saddam Hussein, when they brought Saddam Hussein, they only read seven cases, but our first case, first crime which Saddam Hussein did in Iraq uh, was not in the list, was not there. Therefore, we had an, the committee had an emergency meeting and, and, and we decided we put the case and we called it case number eight on the 24th of, of, of July, 2004. And, and we managed to, uh, to get Saddam Hussein uh, tried on, on this uh, genocide. Uh, in conclusion, the fate of these hostages is still unknown and the current Iraqi government should, uh, should establish a special committee to investigate the whereabouts of, of the hostages and uh, what has happened to them. The Iraqi government should, re should reinstate all the rights of the, these deportees, uh, deported families with with a compensation plan and, and encourage the return of the ones whom are still refugees in Iran and, uh, and, and, and other uh, countries. This, this is the, the morning after Saddam Hussein uh, execution. Uh, we went to the uh, Halabja Memorial tree, which is uh, we planted in the, on the second anniversary of Halabja on the 16th of March. Uh, 1990 at Queen's Park at Glasgow uh, Main Park uh, at the time where we showing the crimes of Saddam Hussein of our disappeared hostages and of uh, the uh, victims of the chemical attacks in Halabja. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kamal, for your presentation. I'm so sorry for everything that happened to this component, especially your family. Um, I, um, I gave a room for the examination for the examination of Faili Kurdis in my book. 
Dr. Kamal spoke a little about the history of the region. And then after starting Iraq-Iran war, he talks about the a process of uh, deportation, faili, the faili Kurds and uprooting them from Iraq. Um, we, uh, I'm sorry we run out uh, the time. Uh, now, if there is any questions, now let's start with your valuable questions for the uh, presentations. Uh, I have one question here, uh, Thomas McGee. Uh, he said, many thanks to Dr. Kamal for your presentation on this quite uh, undercover topic. I believe that in particular, the citizenship stripping of uh, Faili Kurds has received uh, in significant consideration as an action of genocide. I wonder if you might be able to give an update on the possible ongoing legacy of uh, statelessness, even following the 2000, 2006 decision and nationality law to restore their citizen, citizenship. Uh, are there faili Kurds who have struggled to access their restored citizenship until today? Yes, yes. Uh... There are many, actually, although they put in uh, this resolution by the Iraqi parliament, by the Iraqi, uh, various Iraqi government, as I, as I highlighted in my, in my last uh, slides, uh, but uh, uh, the, many of them still uh, denied uh, to, to take back what is, has been taken. I have actually been into some of these departments um, uh, in, 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 in Iraqi nationality, uh, passport and identity cards uh, departments. And uh, I have actually saw the files of our people. I physically, one day I'll publish, uh, I took photographs actually of this, where uh, it says on these files, deported families uh, on, on the actual cabinets. And inside it, uh, there is the files where they kept the, the belonging, the passports and the things of, uh, of some of our, our people. And I found my own family uh, documents there when, when I went there uh, three years ago. Uh, there is still a lot of obstacle for, uh, for them, uh, for many of our people. Some actually got uh, uh, their Iraqi identity uh, documents back and some they couldn't, they put a lot of uh, obstacle. It depends who, which department you go to and who's handling it. If, if, if the officer working there, if it's sympathetic, will collaborate and, and, and implement the rules and regulation, uh, which is, which is uh, uh, and the resolution passed by the Iraqi gov government and the, and the parliament. But if, if, if so many of the former Saddam Hussein uh, regime uh, Baathist uh, officer uh, being brought back to, to work. And these people are still uh, causing a lot of problems, not only for our people, but for many, many Iraqi people. Therefore, yes, uh, there, are, uh, there are still obstacles. And this is what, what we actually demand from the, the current Iraqi government to facilitate and, 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 and they, 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 our people, they don't need lawyers or they don't need to prove who they are. <laughs> you know, they, they are all well known, their addresses, their, where, where they studied, where they lived, they have all the documents. But unfortunately, as I said, there is a, a lot of bureaucracy and some of the, the Baathist, uh, former Saddam Hussein's uh, officers still working uh, in, in these departments and, and causing hinderness. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kamal. Uh, now, Dr. Sardar has a question for uh, Mamusta Anabaz. Uh, please, Dr. Sardar. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for uh, great uh, presentations. Um, I was wondering, uh, using Hannah Arendt uh, to relate to explaining the Anfal, there's a danger in that methodology is that, that um, reducing the state relation to genocide, only a form of state, a type of state might commit genocide, which is a totalitarian state. 
and may exclude the other form of state. But historically and globally, uh, we have seen and known that um, every type of state has been committing genocide, whether it's a socialist state, uh, an imperial state, colonial state, even the uh, militia, what uh, Mahmoud Mamdani compares between Hashdi Shabi and um, Janjaweed. What Janjaweed does is regarded as a genocide, but what Hashdi Shabi does is not regarded as genocide because of the international regime that they uh, function within it. Uh, there's a great article in uh, LRB, London Review of a book comparing the two. So um, the genocide is not related to an ideology per se or the nature of this or the type of state. I think uh, James Scott also highlights that. Uh, I will uh, come to that also in my uh, talk later on in afternoon. Uh, it's it's we have to emphasize every type of state has a potential and a danger of committing state and has the ability to do that, not a, only a totalitarian state or a nation state or any uh, type uh, or limited type of state. Um, I would like to relate that to Yvonne's uh, uh, presentation that he talked about uh, the militia uh, and in Iraq and militiaization. Uh, when British founded Iraq, they come, uh, they sat down and thought, how can make um, uh, kind of a popular people, folk uh, in a German, they say, out of this uh, disparate uh, ethnic and uh, religious identity. And I think that, um, what they come up, uh, what they come up with it was the German model is a suitable model for Iraq. And German model means that you bring all these disparate people, different people, German were 100 Bergs, uh, and through a military force. And German model is uh, <clears throat> building a nation through military. And that was applied to Iraq. If you, <clears throat> sorry, if you see Iraqi history, Iraqi army was established eight months before the official establishment of Iraqi state. So it, from the beginning, it was a military state and a military played role. Then militia came and throughout the history, militia has been part of this functioning state. Militiaization of Iraq is, is from Haras al-Qawmi or National Guard to nowadays, it has been part of the state. So in, whether it's Josh or Kurdish, it's, 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 it's an essence of this apparatus of this state, how it's function, how um, deals with the crisis, how tries to um, justify things, how try to evade the, pro, uh, the crimes that sometimes militia commit a crime and state uh, kind of uh, tries to avoid or stay away from it or deny their responsibility. So in that way, we it's the Yvonne's uh, um, uh, uh, presentation is really touching a very understudy area as it's important to highlight that the role of military in making Iraq and then the militia in functioning such a state and actually it will have a, a great establishment for how the Iraqi state will emerge in the future or what kind of state will emerge because we now in living in a really uh, um, an established coherent complex uh, militia state so I just wanted to bring this comment and uh, question together. I don't know what, um, how will be the response. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Sardar. I don't know if uh, uh, Mama Sanabas have any uh, comments, but uh, please, very short. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sardar, for your uh, important question. Uh, I agree with you. Um, every state has uh, possibility uh, to commit genocide again against uh, different uh, groups inside um, uh, the, uh, this uh, country, the state. Uh, but uh, in my case, I particularly um, try to uh, apply Hannah Arendt's theory of totalitarianism uh, to uh, Basism and Anfal in uh, Iraq because uh, I think. Uh, uh, our the theory uh, can uh, help us to uh, have a better understanding uh, how uh, Ba'az justified uh, Anfal against the Kurds. And um, in her theory, we uh, can uh, we can uh, find uh, these elements to uh, explain the relationship between uh, totalitarianism and uh, genocide. Um, 
and uh, Iraqi uh, government and the Saddam Hussein's regime uh, is um, similar to uh, Nazi Hitler in uh, Germany in, in uh, many ways. And even in uh, their um, uh, perspective uh, for a state, they both uh, see a state as an instrument or a tool to um, achieve their uh, ideological uh, goals. Uh, so, um, uh, that, but um, Nazi's ideology is based on race uh, and uh, Ba'as ideology is based on uh, faith. Uh, that's why um, for uh, Ba'as uh, race, what is for uh, Nazism, uh, faith is uh, for uh, Ba'asism. And uh, thank you uh, very much. Thank you, Mohsanavaz. And now we have uh, Professor Ofra. Uh, Professor Ofra, thank you for your uh, participation and your contribution. Yeah. Uh, she Very has... quick comment and yeah. question. Yes, um, she... First of all, the bus also couldn't rely on the Juhush because in 1991, the Juhush, you know, went to the other side and supported the, the Intifada against the right, Iraq, yeah. against the bus. This is one comment. And the question, I think, for all the whole participants, to what extent Iraqi, Arab Iraqis, are uh, intellectuals, are trying to come to terms with this genocide? Do they um, examine the issue? Do they speak about it? Do they write about it? I think this is very important, because if the intellectuals do not do it, who will do it? So this is a some, you know, a, a question which I think will, if you have an answer, Nabaz, I'm very interested. Otherwise, I think this is an open question to all participants and maybe for future research. Thank you, Professor Afra. Namaste, Nabaz. I'm sorry, just uh, I didn't get that uh, question. Uh, could you repeat it, please? Briefly, I'm asking if you can come across intellectuals who are writing about the Anfal and the Arab uh, Iraqis who are writing, except for Kanan Makia, you know, he, he spoke about the. Yes, of course. Of um, the I'm the not floor is yours, about, please. Yeah. Uh, not about Kanan Makia, but am I? I'm asking to what extent do they come to terms with this issue? To what extent? they try to research it. And if not, what is the problem? What, how can you involve them in such, in this issue? Uh, yeah, th uh, thank you for your uh, important question. Uh, yeah, actually I um, uh, aware about uh, Kanan Makia's work and uh, I re relied on uh, his, um, researches about uh, Anfal and uh, Ba'asism uh, in Iraq and uh, his works about uh, Hannah Arendt as well. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I uh, didn't work about other uh, Iraqi intellectuals and uh, it's really a good uh, suggestion to do uh, that in uh, the future. Thank you so much. Uh, yes. Actually, can I, can I, can I uh, uh, Yes, I, doctor. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there are many, many articles and many, many books actually by published by Kurdish intellect on the Anfal uh, campaigns and Anfal operations, and uh, this is also including on Halabja. I mean, uh, I personally uh, did write about it at the time and. Uh, when, when actually was happening and we try to stop the Anfal uh, with our, the first Anfal for, with our failure courts, second Anfal of the Barzanis, the third Anfal of our Ger uh, Germian uh, Kurdish people, which about 182,000 people uh, totally uh, uh, annihilated and disappeared. Uh, we, we did uh, write about it. And, uh, and many, many other Kurdish uh, uh, people have uh, actually Dr. Kamal, she's talking about, about Arab intellectuals, not Kurdish. 
no, 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 no. I say no because she say, have you? She she asked have have Kurdish people have the wrote about it? No, it, she asked Arabs. She said, yeah. are there Arab intellectuals in she, Iran? Uh, yes, exactly. Oh, Ara Arabs. Ara Ara Arabs. Uh, Arabs, Arabs uh, uh, there, uh, there are many Arabs actually wrote about it in, in a newspaper articles. Uh, I remember in the, in the 80s, in the 90s, there were Arab people. One of them is Mr. Sami Faraj Ali when he has his own uh, newspaper in London. He did write about, about this. Many others, I can't remember them. At the time, uh, it has been written on it. Uh, uh, but I can't remember their name. There, there are, there are Arab people. This is actually, uh, as as you know, there is. Uh, we, we don't want to make uh, this this work and this presentation Kurds, Arab, and things. The the whole of the people of the Middle East are victims of these international uh, agendas. The whole of the there there we have a lot of very good Arab uh, friends in Iraq and all over the, the, the Arab world. Uh, we, this is not uh, against Arab or against Turks or against Persian or against uh, Kurdish, uh, Kurdish people or whoever. This is actually is a, is a humanitarian thing and how the big powers from the West and East are imp, uh, Im, implemented these uh, policies and, and, and planted it uh, in the region uh, to put people uh, uh, against each other. There are many, many Arab people who are totally sympathetic uh, to, to, uh, to the non-Arab people, especially to the Kurdish people. Uh, therefore, therefore, please, uh, we don't want to present this uh, as an issue, uh, a problem between Arab and Kurds. No, it's, it's the regimes which, which we brought by the big powers into the region uh, uh, and, and to follow their policy of this uh, the division, discrimination, of, of genocide. Uh, and, and stir up all the time uh, from that. When, when the region was getting real Saddam trying to get some stability, uh, they brought in Qaeda. Then after that, they brought in ISIS and uh, just to stir up and cause trouble. But yes, there are many Arab people, but I can't remember their name, uh, uh, journalists, writers who wrote about the Amphal operations, who wrote about the Kurdish genocide, uh, and uh, but I can't remember them. If okay. I come across them, I will be happy to send it to you. Thank you, Dr. Kamal. It's a uh, controversial uh, subject, uh, and there is some of them uh, who uh, de deny the, the, the genocide. Anyway, um, I have Dr. Uh, Botan Magdid. Uh, please, Dr. Botan, and then uh, uh, Solmas Karimi, Dr. Solmas Karimi, or yeah. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank, uh, thank you for this interesting uh, speech. But I think I have to not agree with Dr. Kamal because yeah. uh, I'm afraid the issue of Anfal is, is a very sensitive issue and it has not been taken uh, very seriously by the. This is, uh, so this is an answer to uh, Professor Ofra. So, as she's asking about the Iraqi or the Arab uh, people was writing about the genocide of the Kurds or the Anfal. But as far as I've come across, the, this is kind of been ignorance and uh, like uh, denial, or maybe even the Arab school has been passive about this subject, which is a serious issue about Iraqi identity. So, uh, so I haven't seen or come across with any Iraqi Arabs who been inside Iraq. So I don't talk about the people who are in diaspora or maybe in Europe who might be talk or spoke, uh, spoke uh, or wrote about genocide. But the problem is the issue is the Iraqi people who has been in the middle and the south of Iraq, they haven't come across this project. I didn't take it seriously. And this is the, one of the biggest issues. If scholars do not speak about this, so who is going to speak about this? As Ms. Ofra uh, said that. And my explanation to that, that this is issue that can be seen by Arab scholars as a threat to Iraqi unity. So as, as soon as they come to the topics that is related to the Kurdish issue, they do not take it in academic way. Instead of they can take it in, in a way that is gonna be threatened to Iraqi unity. And this is gonna be like uh, making the Kurds to be more like uh, separate identity from Iraq. So I, I guess this is the issue within Iraqi scholar. And it's in somehow the Kurdish scholars have, uh, have the, ignoring this part, which is very crucial to go to, to, to the South and Middle Iraq to starting to uh, seriously debate this issue. 
and thanks. Thank you, Dr. Vatan. Thank you for your question. Um, I don't know if uh, Dr. Solmas Karimi has a question or... Uh, it was simply, sorry to interrupt you, it was simply just a uh, an agreement with Botan and Ofra that it's not simply the Arabs sympathizing with the Kurds and, and with any of the events that have happened against the Kurds. It's actually more formally through academic work and through debate and through uh, condemning those attacks that you, you get the progression uh, in the academic world. So I just wanted to agree that it's not simply being sympathetic uh, by being a different race. Of course, everyone across the Arab world has experienced uh, the negative effects of the Western uh, decisions, but it's more the, the academic world recognizing this and creating those debates. So I just wanted to agree with Botan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, there is also a comment from uh, Dr. Sardar is he says uh, Ofra in Iraq, they associate and file with Saddam's regime, not with the Iraqi state. So uh, most of the Iraqis don't think that the state is responsible uh, and the state uh, has to act uh, and to take responsibility uh, regarding or towards the Anfal campaigns and other uh, genocide acts. I think there is no more questions and many thanks for all of you uh, for participation and great uh, contribution. Um, we will go uh, after uh, five, six minutes to the next panel. Thank you again. Uh, thank you very much. I'm so sorry, if I may ask a question, how do we join the next session? Do we just stay here? Um, I don't okay. know exactly. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe. Uh, yes, just stay here. Oh, just stay here. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. So then. Hi, Richard. Hello. This is Yasin. Uh, I'm going to chair the next one of the next panels. Uh, okay. And I, and I wonder if I should stay here or do something specific to be able to do this. If you, I beg your pardon. Can you hear me okay now? I can hear you fine. Yes, Yasin. I yeah. Um, I said I'm going to chair one of the next panels. Yeah. Yep. I think you are uh, you are chairing the second. Uh, stream or yeah, uh, stream yeah the, the genocide and memory uh, panel. Yeah, uh, the genocide and memory. It is uh, stream two, uh, Dr. Yasin. Stream two, okay, thank you very much. You're welcome.
Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope I'm not on mute. I want to welcome you to the next panel uh, titled Gender and Genocide. I know that there hasn't been much of a gap between uh, the first session and, and now I think uh, there was possibly five or 10 minutes. And so um, uh, I'm not sure if you want to wait a little bit or to, to continue. Um, you're welcome to um, maybe <laughs> have some lunch while we while we continue with this with this panel. Before we start, uh, I just want to confirm that the uh, the presenters um, are all here. So we have three papers. It's difficult to see because uh, I guess uh, with a with a virtual uh, with a virtual conference. There's no table up the front for panelists to come and and, um, and sit, so I can't I can't see where you all are. Um, but um, we have three papers in this panel. Uh, the first one is called "Gendered Lived Experiences of Marriage and Family and Survivors in Halabja Following the Exposure to Chemical Warfare Agents," and uh, there are there are five scholars who um, who are presenting: uh, Faradun Muradi, Fazl. Muradi, Mia Soderberg, Anna Karin Olin, and uh, Mona Lastad. Um, I just want to confirm that you are here. I'm not. Yeah, 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 yeah. I am here. Yes. Yeah. Ah, terrific. Uh, Faraydun, are you are you presenting the paper? Are the yeah. others presenting with you? Are you the sole presenter? I am going to present the paper. Yeah. Ah, fantastic. Oh, good. That's that's terrific. Um, and then following Faridun's paper, we have uh, Media Fatah from Soran University and Ibrahim Sadiq from Soran University. I know Ibrahim is here, um, and um, uh, and they are presenting a paper: the gender role of and femininity, the experience of Barzani and single mothers. And then finally, we have um, Shilin Fouad Hussein uh, of the University of Urbino, as well as uh, the Geneva Center for, so for Security Policy, who's presenting a paper titled Kurdish Women and Anfal, the Gendered Dimensions of Genocide. Can I confirm that uh, Media Fatah and uh, Shilan Fouad Hussein are here? <clears throat> I'm here. Uh, uh... Victor uh, Stephen, I'm here, and uh, Dr. Media is also here, but she's not presenting. Ah, I'm presenting okay. Alone. Yes. Okay. Thanks for confirming that, Ibrahim. And uh, and Shilan is Shilan here? I can't see her, Stephen. No problem. Well, well, we might start the the panel and um, and. Well, well, we'll keep with the order that the papers are, are listed in the um, in, in the flyer. So we will start with Faradun's paper, and then we'll continue with with uh, with with Ibrahim and Media's paper, and uh, and then we'll we'll see how we go after that. We'll see if uh, Shilan is is here. Um, so um, so we might start off with. Um, with Faradon Muradi, who's presenting a, a joint paper uh, titled Gendered, Living, Gendered Lived Experiences of Marriage and Family and Survivors in Halabja Following the Exposure to the Chemical Warfare Agents. And uh, Faradon Muradi is from the uh, Univer University of Gothenburg in Sweden. So Faradon, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks. I'm happy to be with you today. I'm from Sweden, as you said. Yeah. University of Gothenburg and the, the only EU country here since you are UK is uh, anymore not a member of uh, EU. Yeah, uh, what I'm I want to, to share my screen if it's possible. Do you hear me? Yes, we can see your screen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, as, as, as you see, it's about the perspective of the exposed people post exposure uh, in uh, among survivors in Halabja. 
and uh, I am uh, I am I am medical doctor, a pharmacist, and uh, doctoral student. So I am not uh, so much in uh, uh, like uh, the other uh, presenter. So what I'm going to talk it's more from the medical perspective. Uh, the other presenter talked about the war and uh, feminism and how they are suffered. What I'm going to, so I don't want to talk more, more about it, but uh, uh, the gender related impact of chemical war, uh, warfare agents are not too much studied uh, and we don't have any more knowledge about it. And uh, there is many reasons. One reason maybe is because uh, the, the world scientific is uh, mainly male dominated and they are not so much interested in this case. The other factor may be that uh, uh, since the second war, uh, Europe uh, scientific world are not more interested in chemical warfare agents and the, the medical aspect has not been uh, more priority. Uh, but the existence data says that, uh, excuse me, just give it. Uh, that the, 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 those who are exposed to chemical weapons are hardly impacted. The, among others, the female are more psychosocial impacted. So, uh, so, so what the aim of a study is to, to uh, we, we have uh, just uh, to mention that in Sweden, we have, uh, Establish a field of research, uh, multidisciplinary and multi center. When I say multi center, dispute between many uh, different universities in Sweden and uh, in our other countries like Germany and now South Africa. And uh, multidisciplinary, uh, dis disciplinary, I mean, uh, we have the psychologists, we are anthropologists, we are pulmonologists, we are intermedicine and we have uh, a GP. So we, we want to study the uh, impacts from different uh, uh, perspective and how the survivor are impact and not merely medicine. So uh, uh, when I was in Halabja, I thought that the, the, the female ex-spouse have got problem uh, around uh, getting married or uh, building family. And uh, that was the source of our uh, question, how the exposure to chemical weapons will impact the exposed uh, perspective regarding family and uh, the marriage. Since this uh, as a uh, very, uh, sensitive about the getting married and building family in this community and how the post exposure effect will shift the exposed the human experiences in relation to uh, marriage and family so our method is a qualitative i mean is a semi structured interview and uh, we analyzed with content analyzed approach with anthropological inquiries and we did uh, the study in the city of Halabja in Kurdistan region of Iraq. And we have got the 16 subjects among other 10 females. And the other was mean and the uh, mean age. You see? And we, we got the result. When we analyzed the materials with the content analyzed, we had theme categories and subcategories, as you see here. And uh, the, the results showed that exposure lived experiences include a variety of concern about marriage and family and even social life. Within this context, we divided the manifest content into categories, as you see here, social abandonment and uncertain marriage. Uh, and the latent uh, content uh, was expressed as to get married or not. So it's a very existential, 
uh, existential issue for the exposed person. The question about this uncertainty was a central concern in an exposed individual professional and social life since it's affecting all decision making from the getting married, forming a family, having children to help family financially, having satisfactory sexual relationship and being a, at least an active member in society. That's why we created the model to demonstrate unfolding impact of uh, chemical exposure on family, marriage, social life in relation to health deterioration, which I will later show you. Which about the category social abandonment, I will uh, uh, demonstrate with the coefficient from the exposed interview person. We have got a girl here, which says uh, that uh, the marriage is uh, very uh, essential for her and the, this most uh, uh, thing which uh, she is worried about. Since uh, uh, post-exposure problem and diagnostic stem of uh, chemical warfare uh, exposure is uh, look, looks like uh, we are uh, hamper to get married. The other one is uh, have symptom post exposure is seems to be a hinder to get married to year two, and they are since they are not getting married, they are fear about uh, they will be alone when they are getting old and who will take care of them. And we have got a woman here who has not been able to think about anything like getting married because of his, uh, his uh, post exposure symptoms. The other category is the uh, feeling about uh, being contaminated uh, because while the man, the exposed man think they are been contaminated, or maybe they are contaminated by the exposure, uh, solvent master of other chemical weapons. The women, they 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 are they believe they are contaminated, and is genetically, and they are they will uh, affect their children and so on. The other thing it looks like that those who are being able to get married uh, despite being exposed and despite having this uh, chemical injured stamp, uh, when they get in, uh, deteriorated and they get developed symptoms, they will be divorced. Why? Because they are, uh, injured by the chemical weapons and the other things which I mentioned, this will uh, 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 impact their children and they will get uh, worse and there is, there is no curable treatment for them. The other category is about uncertain marriage because it's not just about the exposed females who are worried or who are not being able to get married, it's about the exposed men because uh, we have got the male head, he says is still, despite getting married, having child or children, he is still worrying about what happens post, because of post exposure symptoms. Uh, and what happens with his marriage? What happens with his family when he gets paralyzed or where, when he gets died? So, uh, And the other is about the uncomfortable couple relationship, since the, uh, to have a good uh, sexual relationship is a cornerstone in a good uh, marriage. And uh, it seems like that who are exposed to chemical weapons, they have uh, uh, decreased in lipido, and it means that uh, they don't have a good quality of sexual relationship. But as we see here, it's not just about the exposed 
the exposed women is, uh, even, uh, is about the unexposed female who are married to exposed men. So even they, we, we see they are somehow impacted by the, these uh, uh, post-exposure symptoms. And the other thing is while the female are exposed not to be able to get married or uh, they are worrying about their marriage, the, the male survivors are suffering in silence because they, due to post-exposure uh, effect, they are worrying if they will be able to bring their children, uh, to arise their children, or they will help their family financially, or, or, uh, or something, some problem, psychosocial problem, which happens during their life and when they get married and uh, uh, get children. So, so they are suffering silence, but due, due to this cultural or uh, uh, in the society, they will not show it as the women do. Uh, here, uh, the model we exposed is about the, at the beginning they have, when you are exposed, you will, uh, develop some acute uh, somatic or the psychological symptom. Uh, by, the, by the time you'll get these symptoms will be uh, delayed and with some of them will be chronically. And when you are about the 30 or 20, it, that's the uh, psychosocial or mainly social problem will arise. And this is what the community, exposed community in Halabja uh, especially and the whole uh, North South Iraq, Kurdistan are uh, challenging this. And they are not being so much highlighted, uh, which is a shame. So uh, as I said, one of the uh, central, uh, one of the finding of this study, which is published in uh, BNG, uh, and actually it was the, our priest realized from Yotobori in, uh, University of Gothenburg was uh, translated in 20, 29 different languages, but not in Kurdish. And it was not even highlighted by the uh, Kurdish uh, activities or Kurdish university or Kurdish researchers in uh, Kurdistan Bashur, which surprised me. But anyway, as I said, uncertainty is a central, lively issue shaping the participant lived experiences and narrative around the aftermath of the attack. A survivors complain of symptoms and which do not in a current accepted medical and diagnostic, both somatic and psychiatric diagnostic categories. So we don't know uh, how to deal with uh, both psychological and somatic symptoms after uh, exposure to chemical. That's why we don't, uh, we are not able from the medical perspective to answer these exposed people. Uh, survivors offer fear that their immune symptoms have turned against them, which is reflected in bodily transformation uh, ex post exposure. This comes alongside chemical contamination, anxiety, and all encompassing uncertainty. Phrases such, I am afraid of getting married, I am afraid of having children, it will kill you certainly, are was often uh, coming in the interviews. The participants lived experiences of social abandonment, stigma, everyday uncertainty as a result of a solver master lead to ethical dilemma concerning living with others, taking partners or having children. As far as social abandonment concerned, it was even an important finding of this study is survivor lived ex experiences of social abandonment, which uh, result at survivor avoid socializing because they feel they are disgusting by others uh, due to post-exposure effect, like they, people perceive these symptoms as infectious or like as tuberculosis. So they avoid it, but it's not the only factor. 
because these uh, survivors avoid socializing because they feel that the people who may be at the event don't understand what they are going through post-exposure. That's why this post-exposure effect, physical, psychological, social, socioeconomic increase in complexity over time and have left the survivors with sense of uncertainty regarding their ability to support a family, have a successful marriage or contribute to society. Since there is a lack of public knowledge regarding post-exposure effects, this has fueled the social stigmatization. So survivors, as I said, do not participate in social events in order to avoid unfamiliar circumstances. Also, there is a shared public memory of chemical bombardment halabja, both post-exposure and after exposure. Survivors, that's why the survivors come together in distinct social circles, rotated instead of shared lived experiences, both during the bombardment and after this one. These shared lived experiences have fostered connecting connection among the survivors, which lead to a collective social abandonment. As I said, there may be a single or individual social abandonment, but these people who come together to share their experiences, both exposure, which is uh, under the so halabja chemical social uh, injured society, it's lead to a, uh, a collective social abandonment, uh, which, which, which really uh, formed a gender condition and it distanced them from the rest of society. Moreover, both women and men have developed an identity, as I said, and the group label chemical weapon injured by Kautui Cheki Kimiawi in Kurdish. This mode of self-identification not only explicitly states that health is part of their identity, and chemical is another part of their identity, it's useful to draw political attention to their vulnerable conditions, not at least health conditions. Their experience, experience, their experience, uh, experience of social abandonment reflect both the lived experiences as chemical weapon injured and society response to an unknown chemical related health phenomena related to a new medically incurable disease. As I said, we from medical society, we don't understand how to deal with symptoms. Since it's not curable, since it's new, and the public, due there, they are not uh, informed about the post exposure effect they perceive this post-exposure effect as uh, transforming the offering to the children or as a infection, tuberculosis, which leads to social abandonment of the exposed people. And the other thing uh, is about the uncertain marriage, another which uh, uh, due to the uh, chemical warfare long-term effect produce a gender condition in which female and male survivors experience marriage differently. As the other presenter uh, disclosed that the post-war effect impact the uh, survivors differently. Here we see post-chemical uh, exposure effect different uh, gender differ differently. For many exposed males, their condition is silent source of stress and suffering due to fear of death due to, uh, to post-exposure effects or not at least chemical contamination and anxiety, which affect all their uh, daily activity to how to deal with the uh, challenge in daily life. 
but the, this effect, uh, uh, the male survivors uh, more like that the dignity of they before they have been uh, like uh, breadwinner of the family. Now this post exposure effect has shifted their role to be a burden of the family. So in our study, we found interesting that half of the male were not, were not unemployed, that they were jobless. But uh, many females perceived exposure as source of trauma, social insult, humiliation, and psychological harm. Overall, 30% of uh, female participants in our study were divorced, 40% were single, and 70 were unemployed. So we see here that uh, post-exposure effect developed differently between the female and male exposed survivors. These and other gender barriers leave the uh, survivor survi females in an even more subordinate gender position than the other women in the same social setting. So due to cultural, it will more be obvious uh, the psychosocial and economic socioeconomic impacts of post exposure among the female survivors compared to the male survivors. Participant lived experiences show that while uh, uh, SM exposed married males, I mean solar master, have a range of consent and sovereign silence, female survivors face divorce, experience of consent marriage, engagement, and live with several related uncertainty in their life. This condition could be related to diagnostic stamp of chemical warfare agents and not necessarily the post exposure symptoms. What I mean here, many of the people I have met and talked to in uh, Halabja, uh, mainly the female, they don't have any post exposure symptoms, but they have the label of uh, chemical war warfare agent injured. This is stamp and both devastated their future life and as a human and to get married as a cornerstone to socializing life and sometimes to have some kind of economic insurance. But we, uh, what I, I, it's not, I'm not be wrongly understood here. What I am talking about the female survivors of chemical warfare in Halabja, I just talk about this community, not the general woman contribution and condition is Halabja. Because as you know, many of the uh, women in Halabja, they contribute to, to their society, good, and uh, it dated back to Adela Khanum, who wrote as the Mayad between 1909 and 1924 in the Halabja. And even the current Mayad of the Halabja is a woman. So, so what, what I mean here, the, the, both the women and the men in Halabja, post exposure, they have. Excuse me here. Uh, they have developed a sense of gender uh, uncertainty about getting married. And it means even there is no scientifically evidence about the genetically effect post exposure of Kim uh, solvent masters, but this is a myth in the uh, Halabja and in other part of. Kurdistan that who have been exposed to chemical weapon will transfer it to their children and 
this has devastated the life of and future of male exposed uh, survivors. Conclusion of our study is to urgency of scientific intervention to improve the survivors of chemical warfare agents, social and family lives, not merely medical, and push uh, the policymaker to address survivors' living in condition and more especially gender differential needs. You just can't treat the uh, exposed expose survivors' problem by building a hospital. It's just a part of solution. The other parts, they have got gender differential needs which must be uh, answered. And must of all, there must be uh, evidence-based consultancy to these people who are getting married to help them to take a good decision uh, in for, for getting married and not counseling their engagement. So thank you for being with you and having a nice summer vacation. Uh, here is my son and that's my clinic I'm working. That's how it looked like in Sweden when you know, the kindergarten is closed and you should take out both the clinic and your children. And I have four minutes and any question I'm here to answer you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Faraydun. Um, I think there'll be a lot of questions for this. This is a very interesting paper indeed. I, I have questions myself, but what I, what I might do is um, I might leave questions until the end. So we'll hear the second paper and then we'll have a general Q and A at the end um, for, for both papers or three papers if we hear all three. So um, the second paper we're going to hear now is from Ibrahim Sadiq. And um, this is um, the title of this paper is The Gender Role and Femininity, the Experience of Barzanian Single Mothers. And so this is a paper co-written by Media Fatah and Ibrahim Sadiq, both from Saran University. Okay, uh, thank you, Stephen, for uh, your. Uh, um, uh, I'm uh, presenting alone this uh, 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 this research, this uh, uh, papers. Uh, anyway, um, my or our um, presentation is about the gender role and feminism. The ex uh, parents of Barzani single uh, mothers. Uh, the the Iraqi state, uh, led by Baathists, followed a policy of divide and rule. So all Kurdish components were a possible target in one or in another way. For every Kurdish component, Baathists were waiting for opportunity to let them uh, carry out their uh, plans. So there is a uh, different stages for genocide. I'm not going to mention all of the stages because uh, of the time to spare some time. Um, but uh, in very short, there was um, uh, the militia of Haras al qaumi in the beginning of uh, 1963, uh, they uh, they killed hundreds of Kurds uh, and displaced thousands of them in an attack of the uh, area of uh, Kirkuk and Arbil and in Mosul and other places. Uh, there was also, as uh, Dr. Katuli uh, talked that, uh, as about failed Kurds and then the process of Arabization. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, the evacuation of rural areas be began in a systematic process after 1975. Uh, at that uh, campaign, they destroyed more than 4,500 Kurdish villages and towns, uh, and they 
uh, deported all of those people to uh, concentration campus or forced campus as mentioned by the Kurds. Then the uh, genocide of or gender side of Barzanis in 1983, then uh, unfound campaigns as I call is the final solution. Um, regarding the Barzani gender side, uh, there is a, uh, for those who are not familiar with uh, the, the region, there is a region called Barzan, uh, there is a village or a town called Barzan, uh, and um, uh, there is different villages uh, belonging to that uh, uh, town. It is a mountain region located near the border uh, triangle of the current international borders, which is the artificial division of the land of Kurdistan between Turkey, Iran, and Iraq. Uh, the Barzani de deportation um, have been the, the Barzani's deportation have been uh, subjected to uh, this deportation since 1975. Um, in, the year, in that year, the forced displacement of the Barzani's to several areas in uh, Iraq, specifically to South Iraq, uh, and uh, uh, they faced a very difficult time uh, around five. 100 people were died because of a uh, uh, difficult uh, situation at that uh, areas. Then um, they have been returned to a forced campus in uh, around Arbil city, uh, the capital. Uh, there was uh, two uh, campus specifically for Barzanis called Quds and al Qadisiyah. These two names, uh, if you uh, focus on it, it, is, uh, it belongs to the Arabization the, because these two names are, uh, doesn't have any relations with the Kurdish language or Kurdish uh, land or Kurdish society. Uh, others were deported to uh, three other camps, uh, which was Diana, Harir, and uh, Baharka, but were uh, mixed with other Kurds in that uh, forced camps. Uh, on uh, 30 of July, 1983, uh, both complexes or campus, uh, Quds and al Qadisiyah, were besieged with a large security forces of Iraqi uh, regime at that time. Um, in the beginning, they have been told that they said, we will take you to Kharkuk. There will be a meeting and then we will return you. But uh, none of them uh, responded or uh, believed that uh, what they said. Um, then they started uh, to gather all the men between uh, the ages of 10 to 70 years old. Uh, were forcibly gathered uh, and transferred to an unknown uh, destination. Uh, the same story repeated in the forced campus of Diana, Harir, and Baharka. But there, um, they were the only targets because, as I said, they were living with other uh, Kurdish components at that uh, places. Uh, so they were the only who were targeted. Among the Barzanis, there is a religious sect called uh, Khurshidis. 95% uh, of uh, this uh, sect or this uh, religious sect uh, have been targeted and they all of them, 95% of them uh, have been taken and uh, disappeared. Uh, I'm going to, uh, to show uh, in three parts 
the, the main uh, subject of our research. The first part is uh, the psychological effect, effect of the crime of genocide on single mothers and suppressing the feeling of their femininity. On the morning of, as uh, I said, of July, the Iraqi security and intelligence forces besieged the Quds and al Qadisiya com complexes, both of which are located near the Hushtapa subdistrict of the city of Arbil. So a few days later, uh, the, the other uh, complexes have been targeted. In these two campaigns, about 5,000 to 8,000 Barzani uh, men, Barzani men, just men, were arrested. Um, we talked to uh, some of these uh, women who uh, has lost their relatives, man, uh, brother, or son, or any other relatives. Um, about the, yeah, as, as they were single mothers, one of them said, until now, uh, sometimes I feel like they have come back. I don't know if it's a dream or a reality, but I never lose hope. So this is a psychological situation. It is difficult to describe it. From here, we see a human being with a set of human qualities and uh, they express a set of pains that are uh, considered eternal, the set of mothers who were uh, created. Um, I'm going to the second part. Um, one of them has said, uh, of course, in the relation with femininity and social uh, status, uh, one of them said, I don't wear colored clothes. Black clothes are making me calm. How can I think of getting married again? Uh, a faithful person after such a complicated situation does not think about such a marriage again. When we ask them, of course, uh, why you were not married again. Who thinks of marrying again, she said, assumes that she feel like a woman, but I do not have that feeling uh, since my husband was kidnapped. The self-expression here from a painful uh, interior because of a crime in which the state is the first responsible, placing those mothers in a painful psychological state, which made them uh, suppress their sense of their femininity. Um, There is another, uh, another uh, example of their uh, expressions. Um, that's, as she said, uh, one of them said, uh, if I got any kind of work, I would accept it. And I did not care whether that work was for males or females because I was obliged, obliged to get some money for the sake of my children because they were besieged and the Iraqi uh, security um, let nothing to enter the, the, the uh, camp. So they had to go out of the camp and work and get some money to live with. Um, regarding the third third part of the research, the social role of Barzani women and changing the gender role, representing the male gender role by Barzani women, maintaining the family, uh, securing material needs. 
Uh, this part, of course, the most important part. Uh, gender is not a trait that is born with human, uh, but rather a social constructive product and the result of a discipline, political and social process. One of its uh, products is values and social norms. In this process, with regard to the distribution of work within the family, the role of the man in the work outside the home, uh, find the means of uh, sustains, sustains and maintain the family and its security. On the other hand, the role of the woman's gender is cleaning the house, preparing the cooking and taking care of the children. In normal times, the gender do their normal roles. This takes the general form and imposes it on all uh, family members. In the general daily activity of the family, the distribution of work, uh, rights and duties is reflect in the reality of the social status. In normal cases, social conditions may change in relation to gender circle, especially or if we face an uh, exceptional situation without the will community members and outside their capabilities. Or in uh, there is, uh, or if there is a re recruiter in the capability of the traditional gender role, the role must be filled, even if it is forced. And in this case, one of the participants says, for fear of our honor, if we were a group of women, we would take turns guarding until morning. And we thought if we were uh, vigilant that they would not be able to uh, transgress us. In the culture of the Kurdish society, specifically in the previous time, honor is a serious matter and people care about it according to the scales of society and general culture. So the Barzani woman resorted to a uh, garden in order to reserve their honor and for fear of uh, comments, harassment and in uh, fearment, um, infringement, sorry. Uh, preserving the family and their children in social customs and traditions in general. A male job, but after the crime of extermination of Barzani males, the female took on the job and their uh, pivotal role. Another participant, and participant here in, the regard, in this regard says, if I got any kind of work, I would accept it and I did not care whether that work was for female or uh, for male or females, because I was obliged to get some money for the sake of my children. So if you uh, focus on, uh, on these uh, speeches of uh, participants of, the, of women, uh, you see that they were in a very bad situation and they uh, took with the, as, with the time, they took the role of men and they could do uh, or implement that role with very success. Um, therefore, uh, no permanent nature of the roles. There are many that influenced the change of roles. What is important here is that these mothers prove that roles are a social product and that there is no permanent nature of these roles. In recent years, Kurdish women have proved 
that they can become fighters too in order to fight terrorism. Thank you very much for your listening. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. A very, very interesting presentation. And um, uh, I'm not sure if uh, the if we have uh, Shilin Fuad Hussein here. Shilan Hussein, I'm sorry. If not, then uh, we will go straight to Q and A. We have about. Um, we have quite some time, about half an hour or so for, for questions. So if you do have any questions, I encourage you to either uh, write your question in the chat box or raise your hand and, 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 and I will get to you either way. So we have, um, I can see one hand raised from Solmaz Karimi. So Solmaz, um, if you'd like to ask your question. Yes, hello. Um, it's almost like two questions, if you don't mind. Um, I'm just trying to think of how to articulate it, really. So the first presentation was about, I guess, the impact of the chemical warfare on the women in the region. Um, but what I pretty much gathered from that presentation was that it wasn't so much the scientific, let's say, impact. It was more the societal impact on those women and maybe the impression that a long-term history of maybe patriarchy had given them the idea that maybe they were, i.e., you know, e.g., contaminated or unable to um, fulfill a marriage. Um, and in the second presentation, just one thing about, um, for example, when the gentleman said, "Recent years, Kurdish women have proven that they can fight." Um, my mother was a fighter nearly 40 years ago and um her friends before her have been fighting for 50 60 years so actually i don't think it's recent years i think women in kurdistan have been fighting for a very long time maybe they make up a minority um but certainly have not proven it recently um so i guess the question i have is uh, is it true, is it, to what degree was it the result of ANFAL that these women were impacted more so than the patriarchal society that they have endured for so much longer? I don't know who would like to answer that question, but it's something that I, just a perspective that I took from both pre presentations. Uh, was it for me to... Uh... Yeah, like I said, it, it, I don't know who to direct that question to, either one of you, but essentially, is it, is it so much the, the event that highlighted uh, women's position in Kurdish society and, and I guess the impact of the, that event on those women? Or could mm -hmm. we even argue that it's the, the cultural or the society that they have lived in for longer than that event that has led to the impact on these women? Uh, actually, I can't generalize the situation of Barzani women on all the, the Kurdish women because the Barzani women, or uh, they have uh, in one or another way, they have own uh, traditions and own uh, way of life. So uh, it is difficult to generalize it. Uh, secondly, um, uh, they uh, they took. Um, they implement their role without their fathers, their sons, their husband, uh, or their relatives in a, a very difficult situation at that time before the Anfal campaigns. There was a, a war between Iraq and Iran and all these campus Barzani families were uh, besieged with the uh, Iraqi forces and uh, they were sometime uh, uh, attacked by the harassment by the Iraqi forces. So they were living in a very uh, difficult uh, situation. But beside of that, they fought, they could 
um, work, they could uh, educate their children successfully, and uh, they they did it. They did it, and uh, uh, until uh, it was right, until the uh, uprising of the Kurds uh, in 1991, they lived in a very difficult situation. So I didn't mention all the, the uh, speech of participants, but anyway, uh, I just wanted to show some of the examples of their uh, struggle. Thank you very much. Yeah, should I? Yes, you can, you can, uh, doctor. Yeah, yeah, what, what I told about the impact of the chemical weapons or the perspective among the exposed survivors is, uh, is almost about the getting married. And in our, in our first uh, article, which is published in Close One, we, we, we demonstrated a, a term, medical term, which is called uh, chemical contamination and anxiety. What we mean with that, that these people have been exposed to uh, one of the most uh, the traffic uh, uh, accidents in the modern history. And even many of these people have no post exposure symptoms, but still they have the label some chemical injured. Well, it's another question which might be discussed another time, but this label have caused some kind of, at, which is another term which uh, is called sociogenic illness. It means when you are sitting in the room in somebody with COVID-19, someone is coughing and the other, all, all these people will get some kind of anxiety. They have been uh, contaminated with coronavirus. They can say they have been, and they may be right, they have been, but since we don't PCR test is not positive, we don't perceive these people like contaminated. In this case, legally, these people are injured by chemical weapons, but scientifically, they don't have any symptoms. But still, these people uh, uh, perceived as contaminated. And what happens to them during the daily life? They blame the contamination. If they are coffee, if they uh, if they uh, they are tired, if they feel they are sleeping bad, they blame the contamination. They may be right because with the, the medical uh, society, we don't have answer. It's very new, so we don't know if it's right or not. Since as far as the uh, getting married is concert, there has been some uh, studies about the, in male veterans, war veterans, which seems post exposure, there, there are some kind of uh, differences in the male sex hormones. But how much these differences uh, will cause the uh, birth defect is not sure. But another study, among the both survivors, male and survivors in Sardesh, uh, showed after 15 years, there were no kind of increase in fertility among the both male and women. So what we want to say, there is no, uh, maybe there is, but we don't have any kind of evidence which showed that the female exposed are more impacted and there is no risk of teratogenity. What I mean by term is that those who have been exposed by solvent masters, their children will have some kind of chemical related illness. If I'm not clear, so I will give more explanation. Thank you. Dr. Steven, I just want to tell you that uh, uh, Dr. Shilan has uh, lost her brother just today. So therefore, she couldn't uh, present her presentation. OK. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah. Yeah. 
Do we have any further questions? Um, I, I have a question. Hand, or I have, okay, I see there are two questions. Solmaz has raised her hand again and, uh, and Ofra. Um, Solmaz, is, if your question is a follow-up question, we might go with yours first and then Ofra will follow with your question after uh, that. I, I don't know if you would consider this a follow-up question. It's more just a, a comment. I wonder if Dr. Moradi has explored the impact from maybe a comparative study um, with, sorry, the impact of the Agent Orange in Vietnam on the women there or on the society there, because I think from an Eastern perspective, the whole idea of marriage and contamination could possibly relate to the, to the same event in Iraq or Kurdistan. Yeah, no, uh, well, well, I have studied uh, studies in the Vietnam and still here, since we, we can't do a randomized study uh, as is not ethically correct to put some people on chemical weapon and after years uh, follow if this, there is a stratogenic effect. So all these, even in the Vietnam and other in the India post for uh, 1984. So there was the chemical accidents there and industrial. And in Iraq, Halabja, and in Sardash, uh, we, we don't have any uh, very reliable uh, documented uh, evidence which show that exposed to chemical weapons will impact the uh, women uh, ability to give healthy children. Uh, this is the part. Another part is that if, if the uh, uh, burst effect uh, happens after exposure to chemical weapons, it's not a matter of the female exposed. It should be a matter of the male exposed too. But what we found out in uh, Halabja is just the female who are more exposed, impacted by this kind of uh, uh, teratogenic myth, I call it, since we don't have a scientific evidence. It's like that they are more psychosocially impacted. And actually, they since in the this uh, in uh, maybe we, we have discussed it in our uh, article in detail uh, as is published in BMG, since the uh, marriage is the only uh, legalized path of having sex in this community and uh, getting marriage, getting marriage is the only uh, legalized or morally correct path. So this these female who are not getting married in this community and those women who are getting divorced or are forced to get divorced, they are, they are dehumanized because they, they don't have, they are not allowed to have a relationship outside the marriage. That's what all the matter is about. The, it's a gender, uh, gender uh, issue. And even so, I, as I told you, uh, as I disclosed in my presentation, even the male exposed, they are suffering in silence, but it's the women who are mostly impacted since the, this community who, the, is the male who are proposals to get married and not vice versa. And uh, now we have a question from Ofra. I have a question for Ibrahim. Does he hear me or he's disappeared? Yeah, I'm hearing you. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Uh, my question is um, now the KRG is ruling in Kurdistan, right? My question is th did they do anything compensation for these women, for the Barzanis, women who remained widowed? We know that it was Baghdad. <laughs> You know who did the, the all this this appears, but the question if the KRG government uh, took it upon themselves to compensate, to support, to to help these women to a better life. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Ofra, for this question. 
Unfortunately, uh, uh, the KRG officially didn't do anything for that. Uh, there is, uh, I don't know, there is maybe some help and uh, the improvement of uh, the area of Barzan and uh, uh, some other procedure. I don't know exactly, but uh, generally uh, it is the uh, responsibility of Iraq, the state of Iraq. Uh, and not just the Barzanis, but uh, the Anfal uh, victims and all other victims uh, uh, from Faili Kurdish to, to uh, thousands of victims uh, when, they, um, when their villages uh, or their property, all of it uh, destructed. So uh, the Iraqi government uh, didn't do anything until now. They didn't uh, compensate any uh, victim uh, in Iraq. And uh, there is no, as uh, uh, I don't remember who said that, uh, they don't take it, these pro problems, they don't take it seriously. They don't take anything seriously. Uh, the Iraqi parliament recognized the, the Anfal campaigns as genocide, and they said they have to be a compensate, but uh, further nothing happened. And until now, the, the area of Anfal campaigns uh, in a very bad situation, and nobody cared about that, unfortunately. And even the, the, yeah, the Barzani victims. It is not, it is the government in Kurdistan who should take care in this case because they might take, you know, wait for eternity until Baghdad wake up and do something. So I think that uh, the people in Kurdistan should pressurize their government to take care of this issue. What do you think? Yeah, we are <laughs> criticizing the KRG also every day and in every uh, opportunity. But unfortunately, no, nobody hearing about it. And the case of genocide, until now, not a serious case. Yeah, we have well, a question. Oh, sorry. Can uh, I continue the question? Because please. I'm yeah. asking, they don't do it because they want the question to remain open or because they don't care or because what? But because these are their people, you see? Yeah, yeah. Maybe they are waiting the Iraqi government to do something. And they there is uh, some statement is that they uh, demand the uh, compensation from the Iraqi government. But the Iraqi government even don't send the, the, the salaries of people. So how they are going to compensate uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, the, yeah, the people of Kurdistan. I don't think they are going to do it in this kind of situation. Um, so there is not just uh, this case, there is many cases between KRG and uh, Iraqi government uh, is uh, nobody care about it or they are not doing anything. So, uh, it is a, an answered question, and I, I don't know exactly why uh, they, because there is uh, uh, parliament, is Kurdish parliaments in Baghdad, uh, in, in Iraqi parliament, and there is ministers, uh, there is uh, the, the Iraqi president, even they don't apologize for the yeah, Iraq is uh, Iraq has to apologize for the genocide, but they didn't do it until now. I asked it, even the previous president, Mam Jalal, he said, uh, I am the, I'm Kurdish and I'm the president of Iraq. How I, I apologize for, for uh, something I didn't do it. I said, it is the responsibility of the state. The state of Iraq has to apologize. So if the president Kurdish or Turkmen or Arab or any, uh, or belongs to any other uh, 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 entity, but they don't understand it. I don't know. Unfortunately, this is the situation of Sorofra. Sort 
we have two questions. I'll take the first one from Rojga. Yeah, uh, thank you for your debate. So I have a question. What is the responsible of Kurdish government for those uh, uh, in, 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 in what, what do they for Halabja or what do they for uh, Anfar in Baghdad? Uh, I, I think they didn't do anything. They care about themselves. They didn't do even they, 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 they even they, they, they cannot uh, give them a better life. And uh, another question, uh, just a regime of Saddam responsible for those things you talk about. I think Saddam is directly responsible, but indirectly, some part or some uh, uh, um, uh, uh, European government is responsible for, for those uh, things happen to Kurdish people. This is my opinion. What do you think about that? Thank you. Um, I don't know if it is what it was for me, maybe. Well, uh, I may have some explanation later, but you are welcome. Okay, you know, I don't have uh, more to say that because, uh, as I said, the Iraqi government is not doing anything, it is not going to compensate, and there is uh, the, the problems between Iraqi government and the Kurdish uh, KRG is more than bigger than what we think. Uh, and uh, KRG, yeah, there is a ministry called uh, Ministry of uh, uh, Martyrs and Anfal uh, Victims. Uh, the Anfal victims getting uh, salary, um, but it is uh, not. Uh, uh, that much to, it is not for the compensation of uh, victims, but they are because they are the, the uh, relatives of uh, uh, victims of uh, unfal campaigns. So all, uh, not just un unfal victims, there is another people who lost their uh, relatives uh, as Peshmerga, as others, they are getting uh, uh, an amount of salaries. Uh, nothing else. Well, uh, if, if I... Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, actually, I agree with you, uh, Rojgar, uh, because uh, when uh, after 30 years, uh, the case and issue of the chemical survivors in Halabja is not nor highlighted by QRG or nor by Kurdish academic society in Kurdistan. So just tell me how many study have been done by the Kurdish society in Kurdistan about the case of Halabja, okay? Medically, you know, psychologically. When, when I went back to the Halabja at 2015, so since then I have been in Halabja every year, but there, there is no, research infrastructure in Kurdistan to do a good research, you know? That's a huge problem. And the QRG or, Kurd or Baghdad, by just giving these survivors a label of chemical injured and then some com compensation every month, they, they have the pro they provide these people of a humanized life, you know? As I mentioned, the problem which caused these people, the challenge which they face every day because of this label, a stamp of chemical injured, barcode to chakikimiawi. So you should, or QRG or Baghdad, you just not give these people label and just give them some money every month and say, okay, go and live. And just by building a hospital, they, they problem, they, their challenge are not solved. So I agree with you, the Kurdish researcher inside the Kurdistan should prioritize this problem, this issue, and 
when when I was there, when I went back, I, I told them, I told the Halabja, I told the chemical injured, I told the society that we have done in Sweden, it is psychology, a uh, psychology, uh, psych psychological perspective in the medical, in the anthropological. And it's by the Swedish uh, researchers, by German researchers. What we have come from is to have a, a whole picture, whole problem of these survivors. And not, it's not just about the medicine, it's about the whole the life. Hopefully, next time when I was in Halabja, when they come to talk to, talk to me, they told, okay, we just not just giving these people table, tablet and give, take them to Iran every three or four years, but we are going to take up the other problem. So what we, we know is not just about doing research, how much of research we do is clinically relevant. And this, the result of research should be implemented clinically. So what we do should have a benefit for the survivors. Otherwise, it's just for our case to do our research, to publish our articles, and to do have some titles like PhD, like doctor. It's not about this issue. It's about the survivor after 32 years. They are still have pain, and it's just, just may make me uh, sad and angry when I see they don't have uh, enough access to painkiller, you know? So what we have done to these people, or why me? Why the Kurdish people inside Bashur have done for survivors? Actually, ask me from outside. I am not from Bashur. I am not from Iraq. I am from Sweden. They have not anything, you know? They gave them a label and monthly uh, conversation and deprive them from the humanized life. Uh, we have a question now from Saeed Shams. I don't have a question. I just want to make a point because I'm really a bit surprised by follow-up question from Professor Orfa regarding what the KRG or the authority in KRG, they are not care about. They respond in the, my colleague Ibrahim. Just want to make a short point actually, because she's very well researched, uh, research on the Kurdish issue. Because it's not the question, uh, my eye, my eye, or uh, it's not the question they are care or not. I think the whole setup of the reconstructing Iraq, which is mainly came not from the Kurds, it came from American and British, really. We have to go to that direction. I mean, uh, you know better than anyone. We had a state capitalism in Iraq, at least from 72. And within one night, the Brima and the American authority decided to dismantle that state capitalism and turn it to free market economy. Not only free market economy, but, but on the basis of neoliberalism. And neoliberalism, as you know better than me, is called what they call turning everything to economization and not any anything, including the uh, Barzani women or Halabja women, whoever. I mean, and that reconstruction you know, or the implica implement implementation of the reconstruction society on the business model, really, which is the commodity became the main thing. Uh, they, ignore, they ignore the main social issue, which is there. It's not only the Barzani women, there is a lot of issue in KRG and in Iraq, which is completely ignored and put aside, and they put their investment in different area. I mean, the Barzani women have no commodity value in the current business model. That's, I think, we have to look at that one. And of course, the KRG authority, they are responsible for that. But I think the British and the American who set up that system, and advice to do that system. They are responsible as well, and they have to accept that responsibility. Would anybody like to respond to that? Uh, not me, maybe Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with Dr. Said. Uh, 
totally. Uh, but yeah, as I, I, I think yes. Well, actually, maybe maybe some intervention to Dr. Shams. But after you, please, Dr. Ibrahim. Okay, no, I don't have anything else to to. Well, actually, you may be right, Dr. Shams. It's not just about the care during Baghdad. When first time in 2013, I went to my colleagues at University of uh, Gothenburg and I told them we have got some case of problem. Why should we not do a research about them? Okay, they told me, Dr. Murad, you are, you, are, you are talking about the science fiction. In Sweden, we don't have some such patients, you know? Two, day, two years later, we establish a research at Utebury of University. We have patients in Sweden, tens of patients, and other part of Europe, you know? And this kind, I, I told them, maybe, maybe it's be fine. During the halabja, we couldn't do anything, you know? When Saddam gassed them, when they were killed, we, we were silent, you know? But no, after 30 years, we may can do uh, something to relieve their pain, you know? And that's what happened. That's what we go back to Halabja of the year. However, as I told, infrastructure in Kurdistan is, is, should be better, you know? But I mean, it's not just about Kurdish, it's not about the Baghdad, it's about the, the whole year, whole the world should take responsibility for what happened in, especially in Halabja. Uh, just a few um, uh, small uh, comment, Dr. Uh, Stefan. Um, Kurdistan Rafiq, uh, she asked me, or she has a comment that uh, Barzani women have been compensated. Uh, I, I don't know what kind of compensate they have been. Uh, there is, uh, as I said, there is a ministry uh, of uh, Anfal and Martyrs, but all um, relatives of uh, victims of genocide getting a small salary, small amount. But what we are talking about is an uh, official um, compensation. It is not um, a simple, uh, a simple um, issue. And I think um, the whole case of genocide in, uh, not just in Iraq, even in, in uh, by KRG is not a serious case. So that is the problem. And it is a, a very sensitive case, but there is uh, not uh, an official, even by the Ministry of uh, Martyrs and Anfals, they don't take this case seriously. So there is uh, independent researchers, uh, some activists uh, working on, the, on that case, but officially, uh, I'm sorry, there is, I, I don't know. I don't know if there is any. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few more questions. We have uh, one from Solmaz. And then, I, yeah. Yes. Uh, in, in her initial speech, Ofra mentioned that one of the barriers um, that Kurdish people one of the negatives, I guess, that Kurdish people face was the the unity aspect. Um, I wonder, not just from her perspective, but from any of the academics perspective, given the well known widespread bureaucratic corruption with the KRG, what what barriers or what tools can the Kurdish people use to unify themselves when they have such a barrier like the KRG and its corruption in place? Would anybody like to have a go at that, or any if, if anybody else who is participating would like to contribute? Um, I don't know if it is for Faridun, Dr. Faridun, maybe. Well, actually, I, I don't know so much. I have not. I am not living in Kurdistan, so I don't know. I, but actually, what what I experience when I'm in Kurdistan is, as Dr. O'Brien says, it's not very serious. You know, they they are not they they are not taking this problem very seriously, and that near. I mean, we, we don't know to more 
talk about this one detail, but if you see after 32 years, they are just asking for, you know, painkiller, you know, or just for medicines. So after 32 years, so it shows that the problem is uh, somehow uh, financialized. You know, it's just about the compensation, it's just about the mucha, uh, uh, it's just about the salary, you know, but the whole, the, the whole life, you know, is devastated by this uh, accident and they are not taken seriously, you know? So uh, I, I guess, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Um, my question is more about Kurdish unity and the barrier of the KRG, well, the, the barrier that the KRG poses towards that unity because of that well-known very well known widespread corruption. So that... in, in, in that case, I'm the wrong person to answer you. Maybe <laughs> Dr. O'Brien or someone else. Uh, actually, there is corruption, everyone knows. And there is a kind of uh, uh, difference between, or, uh, between Kurdish parties. And uh, there is a problems uh, regarding the unity of the Kurdish parties. But this is also a very complicated uh, issue, and I don't want to uh, talk about it uh, yeah, here, because it's not related to my uh, research. Um, and uh, as Chinur Ahmed uh, said, the genocide case in, in Kurdistan region is a very complicated case. and. Uh, uh, it needs time until the uh, KRG know that this case has to be taken seriously and sensitively. And, the, uh, and this, this is a totally Iraqi state responsibility. They have to do more regarding the, the, the compensation, the, uh, anything else anyway. Um, I am aware that we are running out of time and I'm just a little bit conscious of the time because, oh no, we have, we have a little bit of a buffer between this session and the next session. So I'll, I'll very quickly, I'll go through, I can see three hands raised, or, well, four hands oh, raised. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, the, the next hand, or actually five hands maybe, uh, there's somebody who uh, whose profile name I cannot see, but there's there's the the password code instead has raised their hands. I'm not sure who the participant is, but um, um, would you be uh, would you that's be able? My, to sorry, that? that's my mother. Daya legal Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Uh, thank you because I, I get the quote from my daughter. So my question is to Dr. Ibrahim. Um, that uh, I think he kind of tried to avoid the uh, answer specific question. Uh, the question related to corruption is um, the academic people in all Over the aspects, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, yeah. In all the aspects, they could definitely uh, um, helping the government, helping the people to understand that the unity is important because when you have a, when the uh, small area like a KRG have a policy of anti-unity, that is recipe for another genocide. Genocide doesn't take in one night, it takes a long time. Like as you see in 2017, uh, with the bunch of the Hash uh, Shabi, 50% uh, of the uh, Kurdistan uh, area being lost. So it would take, uh, take uh, it will just take actually 12 hours. It take another 12 hours to take other part and the genocide would be committed again. So for that, I think that my question directly to all of oh, us specifically to Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, yeah, to Dr. Ibrahim is that, uh, what is the role of the academic to uh, make a unity? Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Actually, if I may, Doctor. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, actually, I know there is uh, many academic uh, 
researchers, um, they are working on, the, on that issue, but uh, um, I, I don't know uh, uh, what the, the responsibility. Uh, because uh, sometimes they don't listen, they don't care about researchers, about um, uh, any any comments, any writings, anything else. So they have own strategy, own or own uh, agenda to do it. So they they don't care, even if there is. There is some some criminals uh, uh, according to the uh, High Tribunal Iraqi High Tribunal uh, of Anfal and another uh, cases of genocide. Some of them are free in KRG. They are they are not arrested and they are they are specifically um, responsible for some cases of uh, crimes. So uh, some yeah this case when we are talking about uh, is speechless. I, I can't say anything regarding uh, the, the whole problems uh, and unity and uh, their uh, behavior with the case of genocide and even Arabization. Arabization is still going on in Iraq. There is uh, dozens of villages in Hanafin, in Kirkuk, have evacuated in nowadays and nobody cared about them. So uh, in 2017, there is a case of genocide in Tus Khurmatu. The Kurds have been targeted specifically. And yeah, so it is difficult to to elaborate all of these cases in, in a in very uh, in this time, very small time, I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt there. I've, I, um, I've lost track of the time and, uh, and I thought we did. So there's now and it turns out the next session is starting right now. So we're going to have to cut this short. It's a very interesting discussion. I wish we could get through all of the questions and I'm, I apologize that we haven't been able to, but um, uh, there's the, uh, oh. the next session is starting now. So if you are, if you are, keen to learn about the Ezidi case that is in this particular stream. Um, if you uh, want to join the panel on genocide literature and art, that is in the other stream. And, and I think I'm going to have to uh, uh, sadly cut this one short. Thank you very much, um, Ibrahim. And thank you very much for Aydun for very interesting presentations. Thank you very much for uh, a stimulating um, discussion and um, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you, Steve. Thank, Thank you very much for you too. Uh, here is uh, Dr. Faisal. Uh, welcome. Okay. Uh, thank you, Richard. I think uh, I'm the uh, I'm the chair of this. Uh, yeah. Of this panel. Okay. So, so that is here. So we're ready to start when you're on. Okay. Um, we have uh, welcome yes. again. Uh -huh. um, welcome again to this panel. Uh, we have three cases here. Uh, the first the one. That, sorry. Sorry, I heard something, Richard. Okay. So uh, we have three cases in this uh, panel. Uh, the, um, the last genocide against Yazidi people, the second one and the third one, uh, second one, born of ISIS genocide, risk of statelessness and uh, stigmatized nationality uh, acquisition for children and Yazidi survivors. Third one is in a search of lost pastors in Iraq by Fazal Muradi. So uh, we are going to start with uh, Mr. Uh, Mamusta Haure Ahmed uh, in Kurdistan Center for International Law. If uh, he hear me, uh, Mamusta Haure. 
uh, his uh, topic is the last genocide against Yazidi people. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. Thank you so much for having me today. And I appreciate your efforts that you have uh, conducted such important conference. Uh, uh, so just let me share my desktop. Do you see it, please? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to present my paper about the last genocide against the SD community. And uh, it's, it's a part of my master thesis, uh, which was about accountability for ISIS fighters and the possibility of creating an international criminal tribunal for responsibility co international crimes. Uh, and I would like to inform you that uh, the KRI is currently uh, working on establishment, a special court for ISIS crimes. Uh, so there's a, an, an important initiation for creating uh, an important uh, special court in, in Kurdistan. Uh, so according to the uh, genocide, con genocide Convention, we have three elements of crime. Just let me, yeah. We have three elements of crime of genocide. The first one is intention, and the, uh, the third one is uh, protected group, and the third one is the, the actors. So I'm going to present maybe my paper. Uh, uh, so that's uh, it was an, an, a comparative uh, uh, paper. Uh, so I will use uh, all of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the legacy of the ad hoc international criminal tribunals, and of course, uh, 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 the, the literature of international criminal law, and I, uh, I will compare with the, uh, the last uh, uh, Yazidi genocide. Uh, yeah, uh, the, first, uh, the first element is uh, protected groups. Uh, so, of course, uh, the Yazidi community is a religious group, but uh, let's see what is the religious group uh, according to the international criminal law. So, uh, my, uh, my paper is purely about law, about international criminal law, and uh, I've used it, uh, the legacy of the international criminal courts. So, religious group is a group whose members share a deeply entrenched belief in a metaphysical control power and whose activities are focused on the fulfillment of their belief. Also, the both ad hoc tribunals, ICTR and ICTY, ICTR International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, which was established in 1994 by the United Nations Security Council, and ICTY International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, which was established in 1993, uh, as well by, uh, by the uh, United Nations Security Council. So both of the tribunals define it uh, the religious group as a group includes the de uh, denomination or mode of worship or a group sharing common beliefs whose members share the same religion, de denomination or mode of worship. So of course, the uh, Yazidi community is uh, uh, a religious group and it's under the protected group according to the genocide convention. So the second, uh, the second element is called uh, the material element, which consists of uh, five actors according to the uh, Genocide Convention. So the first one is killing uh, the members of the group. Uh, according to the elements of crime, uh, the elements of crime which was written in 2010 by the International Criminal Court General Assembly, so uh, defines uh, the, uh, killing the members of, uh, of the group as killing a single victim is sufficient to complete the crime of genocide. And uh, according to the U uh, UNAMI and YESDA organization, 95 mass grave sites of Yazidi people have been found in Mosul. So I believe is that the smallest one uh, contained uh, eight civilians and the biggest one or the largest one is believed to have more than 4,000 uh, 4, uh, uh, Yazidi people. So uh, Irpan parliament estimated 5,000 uh, so, uh, uh, people that, are, uh, that have been killed uh, by the ISIS fighters, but I think the, uh, the number is more, more than uh, this uh, 5,000 uh, people. So the second element or the second, I mean, the second uh, act is causing serious bodily or mental harm to the members of the uh, group or of the Yazidi group. So according to the ICTR appeal chamber, uh, serious bodily harm or torture, could be torture, could be rape, non-fatal physical violence, and serious injury to the external or internal organs. But the serious mental harm includes more than minor or temporary imp uh, impairment of mental faculties, such as the infliction of the strong fear or torture or terror, uh, intimidation or threat. 
So the Council of Europe in, in, its, in its report say that ISIS has committed genocidal acts, including mass uh, uh, serious bodily or mental harm by way of torture, beating, inhuman and degrading uh, treatment. So regarding the mental harm, uh, around 1,100 uh, Yazidi women joined a program in Germany. And according to the uh, results, 70, uh, more than 78% of the uh, women were diagnosed PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And 63% uh, were diagnosed with, with depression. So of course, it's amount of uh, mental harm and it's amount uh, to be an act of the, uh, one of the act of uh, the crime of genocide. According to the ICTR, it must be harm that uh, uh, results in a great and long-term disadvantage to a person's ability to lead a normal life and constructive life. So the Yazidi people in the refugee campus, as, as a result of ISIS attack, the people were suffering with the restrictions and, uh, and concerning regular and health, healthy food. The conditions in the campus, of course, all of you, you know that, were and are unhygienic and uh, the educational, social, cultural, and religious needs were and are made insufficient. So again, according to the ICTY, the women suffered serious mental harm by separation. So the separation women from the, uh, from the men has a profound psychological impact upon the female members of the protected group. So according to, the, uh, to a report uh, which was written by IICIS, uh, International Investigative Commission for Inquiry in Syria, uh, which was about uh, uh, the genocide, uh, the, uh, the, the Yazidi genocide in 2016, It says the Yazidi community at the point at the point at the point of uh, of capture, Yazidi women and children suffer a serious mental harm as a result of being separated from their male uh, families and their, their male uh, relatives. Yeah, again, according uh, so uh, regarding the second uh, 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 according to ICTR, so. Uh, Serious mental uh, mental uh, mental harm could be acts of rape and sexual violence, which uh, which in 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 Rwanda committed against the Tutsi women. So because they are Tutsi, not because they are women. So we have the same issue here in uh, in, in the Yazidi in the Yazidi genocide. Uh, the available evidences indicated that the ISIS targeted Yazidi women not because they are women, but because they are Yazidi and they are women, or because they are Yazidi women. Uh, the, the third, uh, the third act is deliberating, inflicting on the Yazidi community or on on the uh, protected group. So this uh, act is called so uh, slow, uh, slow death. So according to the ICTR, uh, deliberating, inflicting that includes methods of destruction, which do not immediate, immediately lead to the death of members of the group or circumstances, and it should be will lead to the uh, to, to to a slow death. For example, lack of proper housing, clothing, hygiene, uh, hygiene, and medical care. So the element of the crimes, which I uh, mentioned it, uh, define it, uh, the, uh, uh, the condition of life, it says that may, that may be included, but it's not necessarily restricted to deliberate depri uh, deprivation of resources, in this, uh, of resources for indispensable for survival, such as food or medical survivors or systematic expulsion from homes. So, uh, ISIS attacked Sinjar uh, city. So the, the population of the Sinjar was about uh, 300,000 uh, people. So mostly uh, were uh, uh, Yazidi. So as a consequence of the attack, 96% of the Yazidi people uh, fled from the, the, the uh, Sinjar uh, city. So according to the UNICEF, uh, the family who fled to Sinjar Mountain, including up to 25,000 children, and 40 Yazidi children were died daily as a consequence of hunger, thirst, and dehydration. So it's called uh, uh, slow death, not uh, immediately death. The fourth and the fifth, so the last two crimes, which were enumerated in the Article 2 of the Genocide Convention, are linked in the sense that uh, they aim to destroy the future of the group. 
So the first one, imposing measure to prevent births, uh, it's called biological uh, genocide. And the third, uh, the fifth one, forcibly transfer children, it's called the uh, cultural uh, genocide. So according to the According to the ICTR, the patriarchal societies where members of a group is determined by the identity of the father, during rape, a woman of the protected group is deliberately impregnated by a man of another group with the intent to have her gave birth to a child who will consequently not to be belong to the protected group, but to be to be belong to the perpetrator's group. And the sexual violence against the Yazidi women and girls resulted uh, the women do not want to marry or to contemplate the relationship with the men. I mean, I, I mean the uh, ISIS uh, fighters in the future. This was compounded by by sense that uh, uh, they uh, they had lost their honor in this way, and uh, the rape is being perpetrated by the ISIS fighters on the Yazidi women and girls themselves can constitute a measure to prevent births with the group. I mean the uh, the, the Yazidi group. So imposing measures intend to prevent birth with the group can be mental. How, for instance, rape can be measure intended to prevent birth when the person who has been raped refuses to subsequently to, pre, to uh, procreate uh, in, 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 the, in the same way that members of the group can be lead through threats or trauma, not to the procreate. Uh, pro, uh, so I mean, all of the women, is, uh, maybe they, uh, they will refuse to, to, uh, uh, to have a relationship with another man. So relating to the forcibly transforming children uh, of a protected group, uh, in 2014, the ISIS leader, uh, Abu Bakr Baghdadi, issued a fatwa. In, uh, in his fatwa ordered uh, the separation of Yazidi children uh, from uh, their mother and children as young, I mean the, the, uh, the boy uh, uh, children, as young as two years of age were, transfer were transferred to the Madrasa Jihadiyya and uh, the children over 10 years uh, they, uh, they were sent to, uh, to, to, to the jihad institution, and the girls were uh, then transferred with the Iraq and to Syrian uh, uh, as for, 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 for sexual exploitation. So the last element is called uh, intention, or it's called uh, uh, the mental element. That's why the crime of genocide is called the crime of intention. So according to the international court, the first one international uh, court of justice uh, in the judgment between Bosnia and Serbia uh, defined uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the mental element, intention I mean, uh, it says there must be evidence of actors on a scale that establishment intent not only to target certain individuals because of their membership to a particular uh, group, but also to destroy the group itself in all or in part and must, uh, must be to destroy at least a substantial part of the particular group. And ICTR uh, followed the same uh, 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 philosophy. So the ICTR used wide scale attack against the targeted group as a circumstantial evidence to prove intention of, of the perpetrators to destroy the group and define the genocidal intent. It does not require the actual destruction of the substan substantial part, but it should be affected uh, a substantial part of the group. So, but ICTY uh, said genocidal intent, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the mental element, that should be the de facto destruction of the group. So according to this, all of the de definition is uh, uh, the behavior of ISIS fighters toward in the Yazidi community manifested the genocidal intent. So the atrocities systematically committed just against the Yazidi, they are inspired by religious ideology. Many reports de demonstrated that the ISIS fighters asked the people belong to the Yazidi community to convert to Islam or to be killed. So double ICIS, International uh, Investigative Com uh, Commission for Inquiry in Syria, in its report say that one of the commanders in ISIS, uh, in ISIS say that if, uh, say to, 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 to uh, an abducted uh, uh, Yazidi boy, say, even if you see your father, if he's still Yazidi, you have to kill him. So, yeah. So in ISIS fighters, uh, so ISIS fighters entered to the villages and they began to execute all of the villagers in, 
in, in, in, the, in the area of the Yazidi people. So, uh, your time is okay. I, I, give, I will give that's, you okay. That, okay, that was, my, that was my last slide. Okay, thank okay, you so much. That's great. That's great. So, finished? Yeah. Okay, they, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks for this uh, valuable uh, presentation, Mr. Aure. Um, yeah, as uh, all uh, we know, uh, the crimes of ISIS are a stain uh, against Ezidis. I mean, uh, a stain on the forehead of uh, humanity. Especially, there are still more than 2,000 uh, women, I think, or more, uh, still uh, uh, in the hands of ISIS. Um, uh, anyway, we are going to uh, the second uh, presentation, Born of ISIS Genocide, Risk of Statelessness and uh, Stigmatized Nationality Accusation for Children of Yazidi Survivors uh, by Dr. Thomas McGee, University of Melbourne. Uh, yes, um, Victor, please. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased to be part of today's conference. Uh, thanks again and congratulations uh, to thank the organizers. Uh, equally, I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to, to share my research with all of you. Um, so the presentation now, and my presentation now will pick up on an issue uh, an issue raised by Professor Chulman in, in her keynotes uh, speech during the morning, namely questions of legal identity and nationality citizenship for children born to Yazidi survivors of ISIS captivity. So this presentation draws on research that I published uh, last year in an article entitled, uh, the same as the presentation title, Born of ISIS Genocide, risks of statelessness and stigmatized nationality acquisition for children of Yazidi survivors. And I can post a link to the article in the chat for anyone who's interested. Uh, the presentation today also draws on um, research I've continued to do um, in order to follow up on the evolution of this issue um, over the last year. So I think, I think we're all uh, very familiar with the events that took place in August 2014, uh, when the Islamic State extremist group launched its brutal attack on the Yazidi majority area of Shangal, Sinjar. Uh, again, as Professor Chulman highlighted, uh, treatment of, uh, of the Yazidis was differentiated, uh, differentially gendered, we can say. So while thousands of um, Yazidi men were executed, um, thousands of thousands executed on the spot, thousands of women were, were sold into captivity at slave markets. As a consequence, in many cases, Yazidi women who were held in, in both Iraq and Syria by the Islamic State were subject to genocidal rape and abuse. While some of those who had managed to escape opted to remain in Syria, the vast majority did return to Iraq. Uh, and it's in this context, while working in the Kurdistan region with IDP communities there, internally displaced communities, that I encountered Yazidi survivors and their children born following the start of the genocide. So I'd really like to introduce the dilemma of such children um, and their mothers through a quote by, by one of the survivors. She said, this is my son, he is one year old. He doesn't have a birth certificate or any papers. He was my only comfort when I was in captivity, but now I have no idea what will be his future. So in that context, um, within the article that I, I published, I looked at how the, the legal and religious frameworks, that is Iraqi law and the Yazidi religious doctrine, as well as social responses 
have intersectors to present various um, challenges to finding solutions for such children. Solutions in terms of their civil documentation and access to citizenship. So indeed, the, the overall framework in Iraq is highly complex uh, due to these intersections between the legal, social and religious. Um, and while there are certainly um, social and religious debates taking place within the Yazidi community, um, and, and these are highly, highly complicated and challenging in their own right, um, and I've tried to address some of these in the article, but given, given the limited time today, I'm going to focus primarily on the legal considerations. Um, and I'm going to be looking at ways in which Iraqi law may potentially be perpetrating some of the consequences of the genocide committed against the Yazidi survivors and their children and possibly the community at large. So moreover, I would argue that in fact, the legal framework itself curtails the very space that Yazidi Yazidi human rights advocates um, have when, when navigating the social and religious obstacles in search of solutions on this issue. The legal framework can therefore be considered um, in some cases to be aggravating social stigma and, and further entrenching conservatism within religious doctrine, leaving little possibility for humanitarian solutions to be found to date. So based on uh, research interviews with Yazidi survivors, as well as key stakeholders, and, and those included um, lawyers, representatives of the authorities in the KRI, and Yazidi religious figures, I argue that the legal, social, and religious framework in Iraq leaves these children trapped between the risks of statelessness, on the one hand, not being able to access any citizenship, and on the other hand, the possibility of acquiring a dangerously stigmatized uh, nationality. So this is what a nationality that associates the children with their perpetrator fathers. Um, so I underscored the need to integrate legal and religious considerations into attempts to find a solution to this issue while balancing both protection considerations for the survivors and the children born as a result of their ideal. So now what, what is the problem with the law? Um, so unlike, firstly, unlike many states in the Middle East, the current Iraqi nationality regime has overturned many elements of the historic patrilineal logic governing nationality acquisition. Um, so it's removed many of the um, elements that were gender discriminatory permitting mothers since 2006 to pass on citizenship to their children. However, gender discrimination remains in a number of key articles and also intersects with issues of religious identity. So significantly in this case, the law considers any child um, of an unknown father to be Muslim, a detail that is visibly recorded on the civil documentation in the country. The situation of children born to Yazidi survivors of unknown fathers highlights the dilemmas caused by the presence of this religious uh, bias embedded within the law. So despite the reforms that were mentioned in 2006 to remove gender discrimination in the law, the Arabic term majhul um, nasab of undetermined uh, parentage is interpreted to refer only to the father. So it could effectively be translated as undetermined paternity rather than parentage. Um, in the case where a child's paternity is unknown, therefore, they will be automatically recorded as Muslim Iraqi, um, Sunni Muslim, I believe. And this is based on the majority demography of the country. So this is especially problematic in the case of children born to the Yazidi survivors, given the religious dimensions of the genocide, persecution, genocide or persecution they experienced. And in practice, such provisions can be considered as insensitive at best and perpetuating the genocide at worst. So registering children growing up with their Yazidi mothers and extended Yazidi family in internal displacement settings 
often, for example, entirely Yazidi populated camps or unfinished buildings um, as Muslim based on an arbitrary prescription of law can do nothing but increase the stigma these children face. Labeling the child with the same religious identity as the persecutors um, of the community at large presents a heightened risk of family rejection, ostracism and other harms uh, towards the infant and or mother from which the traumatized Yazidi community, from within the traumatized Yazidi community, thus adding to their vulnerability. So humanitarians promoting civil documentation acquisition in such cases therefore have a duty, have a dilemma when it comes to promoting acquisition of civil documentation in order to ensure they are doing their duty not to cause any further harm. So here I just want to um, stress that um, in the face of this stigmatized nationality, many children remained undocumented um, and were at risk of statelessness. Attempts to work on the issue from humanitarians, Yazidi activists and lawmakers and even reformists um, have not resulted in any comprehensive solutions. That said, um, and perhaps these are some of the most interesting findings, some the current Im impasse and recent statements, um, given the current impasse and the recent statements by Yazidi religious figures rejecting to consider the children as Yazidi, it's, it's really important to recall that often on an individual basis, a number of what I'm calling creative humanitarian solutions were found in the early years after 2014. So for instance, one judge in De Hoek stated, um, in cases where the mother had been married um, to a now missing, presumed dead, uh, Yazidi husband prior to August 2014, the judge would confer, look to confirm this man as the father um, on the child's documents on the condition that all family members express their willingness for this to happen. So knowing uh, nonetheless that this was a blatant violation of the law, the judge explained that in what he saw to be the interest, the best interest of the child and, and the family's future, he was, he was willing to suspend his disbelief regarding the age of the child, as long as witnesses were from their side willing to testify to the agreed proposition. Also a Yazidi lawyer working, working with NGOs was, was sometime, told me she was sometimes able to similarly find creative solutions by creating entirely new paternal relations for the child um, for the purposes of documentation. So this was often through, for example, an aunt and an uncle. Um, this required appealing to the good faith of officials as well as family members. And the lawyer explained, we have been able to find solutions um, within the law for a number of cases like this. She said, we want to help the family members, um, so we have to bend the law. And the current kanuni nermbakan in Kurdish. So just to conclude, faced with this impasse um, on more comprehensive solutions, community activists have called on the international community to step up its efforts. Uh, this includes advocacy for reform on the law um, and civil documentation systems within Iraq, for example, to remove references to religion on, on, on official documents. And what, while the recent, uh, I think it's called the Yazidi survivor law um, in Iraq, which was passed, uh, I think it was March of this year, um, has been welcomed for, for recognizing the duty to provide compensation and reintegration support to, to women held by ISIS. It's, it remains silent on the issue of children born to the survivors. Um, it nonetheless refers to children who were kidnapped by ISIS, but not those born in or after captivity. Um, as I understand, one article in the unadopted draft did extend the law to cover such children, but it was later deleted. So final, final point is um, that activists and religious figures have repeatedly called for such cases to be prioritized within international resettlement programs to third countries where the mother and child could build a new life away from the stigmatizing frameworks that currently exist in Iraq. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Thomas, for this uh, <clears throat> important presentation. Uh, last or two years ago, I dealt with this uh, problem. As, uh, as you said, there are many uh, casualties in this uh, process. Even children born of a ZD mother and uh, an ISIS father are considered victims of this uh, situation. Even Iraqi laws and institutions until now cannot deal with this issue in a balanced man manner, for example, because the son follows the father. But the important question here is what kind of father? And even if uh, the father is unknown, all uh, they know that all of these fathers are, were terrorists, even they are alive or not. <clears throat> so far, there is no suitable solution related to this issue, uh, particularly to restore the right of the Yazidi mothers. Thank you again, uh, uh, Dr. Thomas. Now we are going to search of lost pastors in Iraq, but this time Dr. Fazl Muradi going to uh, to search it uh, alone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fazl. Uh, please uh, come and. Thank you so much, Ibrahim, and thanks to Bar and Stephen for um, organizing this event. Um, um, I hope um, not to take much time and um, finish before 15 minutes. Uh, so I start. As you heard, the title of the text is In Search of Lost Past in Iraq. Um, I could have also added Kurdistan. So therefore, I'm going to repeat Iraq and Kurdistan, Kurdistan and Iraq in this short text. To ask who is entitled to reclaim lost pasts in Iraq, or the Kurdistan region, whose past matters or matters most, whose past is damned, or how can lost pasts be thought in relation to ongoing political violence, poverty, gender inequality, lack of access to education and healthcare, and displacement of more than a million Iraqis within Iraq, is then to inquire into the politics of abandonment and haunting. In Iraq as a whole, one can glean how party politics forms what is in French called coup de théâtre, or spectacular turn of events that can be better grasped through a more expansive understanding of memory side or murder of memories or epistemicide or murder of knowledge systems. Memory side and epistemicide are of course inseparable from the history of the modern nation state and as such irreducible to Iraq or Kurdistan. I am therefore not thinking loss or the past in the linear understanding of human history in Iraq that is constantly shaped by certain politics of belonging and othering. I assume we all know of Shiitization, ethnicization and tribalization in Iraq. I'm rather more concerned with the condition that disqualify people from having a past or how ongoing violence in Iraq makes the memories of other generations or other pasts irrelevant in the here and now, and how knowledge about those pasts as violence and generations and survivor as survivors do not exist in the national or public memories or do not travel across generations, time and space. Loss and the past cannot be present, of course, and thus share the fact of hunting. In other words, lost pasts are as much lost futures as a question of abandonment that haunts Iraq at large and the generations that come and go. To think this further briefly here, I turn to two separate historic instances, one in Kurdistan and the other in Kurdistan and Iraq as a whole. So we start with the first. I title it protest. 
as you know, there are ongoing protests and there have been many protests against ongoing political violence and injustices in Iraq, as well as in Kurdistan. Protest has been the condition through which I'm working to understand not only the democracy that was promised prior to the invasion in 2003, but human dignity in the afterlives of genocide and femicide following that invasion. During a protest that engulfed Erbil in late March 2018, Hushan Waziri, a researcher and playwright, and also who happens to be a friend of mine, was arrested together with many others. In what he titled My Kurdish Oppressor, an article that was published by the New York Review, he offers an intergenerational and visceral account of the absence of accountability and political violence with impunity in Kurdistan. He writes, and I quote, did they beat you up? My son asked when I finally got home, just as my father had refused to tell us what he saw in the torture rooms of Saddam Hussein's Mohabarat or secret service. I didn't tell my son everything I had witnessed in detention or at the protest that day, end of quote. Political violence ties Hoshan and his son, but not the son with his grandfather's memories. The son is yet to inherit inherit those memories as he is to inherit his father's testimonies of the protest and detention. Since all memory transmission is transmission of haunting experiences, Hushan's experiences of his Kurdish oppressor will only remain as haunting to his son and his generation that have no direct experience of the violence that has already become embodied memory for Hushan and his generation. The more memories of political violence surge in both Iraq and Kurdistan, the less important or memorable becomes the preceding violence and memories. At the same time, the Iraqi state and the Kurdish political parties or the Kurdis Kurdistan regional government lay claim to democracy and the promise of a better future. My second instant is Sinjar operations about which I have written actually the first socio-anthropological paper and socio-legal analysis of the violence that exists up until now. Sinjar operation meant the Islamic State's genocide and femicide against the Yazidi population. I have written about this elsewhere, as I just mentioned, and here I only revisit through a poem. The poet shared this poem by reciting it from what he called my heart. He was yet to write the poem down. It was his and remain an intergenerational testimony to Sinjar operation that he had witnessed as well as others that he has not witnessed and yet haunts him. The violence was ongoing at the time of his recitation I recorded it like I did other testimonies during my socio-anthropological inquiry in September 2014. I can't mention the name of the poet I hear, and the reason is political censorship in Kurdistan, which as I examine in another study speaks of epistemicide, murder of knowledge, to borrow from Buenaventura de Sosa Santos. Epistemicide is always already social murder. The one depends on the other. I start with the poem, the title of which is Shingal. My Shingal is crying again for my sisters and brothers, my religion and dignity again. The endless screams of my mother has reached Lalish again. My home is looted and burned again. Our elderly and the little ones are beheaded and the brides and young girls are abducted again. I ask myself, why? Mother, where are you to hold me close to your heart? Your child, mother. Today it is Ferman, it is Ferman, it is Ferman again over the Mount Shingal. Grandmother, it is plunder, it is plunder, it is plunder again. 
Azidis, as many of you probably know, were not only abandoned by the two dominating Kurdish political parties and the Iraqi state, and as such remain cut off from juridical belonging, but also radically otherwise as devil worshippers and dirty people in the national and public memories in both Iraq and Kurdistan. In both instances, Hosheng's experience of detention while protesting and Shingad, an experience of genocide, abandonment of the right to citizenship, the human rights to protest and to exist is at issue. To abandon is to subject to erasure, to destroy, to let die or to participate in acts of annihilation. The recent history of Iraq is replete with abandonments. It is not difficult to learn how before the genocides and femicides of the 21st century came colonialism and the post-colonial genocide and femicide in the 20th century. In other words, apart from the colonial violence of the Ottomans, the British and the United States, the economic sanctions, or the United Nations Oil for Food program in 1996 that increasingly turned the Iraqi peoples into biological duration. There are other separate acts of annihilations in Iraq to remember. The Sumail massacre against the Assyrians in late 1933, Al Farhud against Iraqi Jews in Baghdad in early 1941. The dispossession, killing and deportation of Failis in late 70s and through 80s. The Dujail massacre targeting the Iraqi Shiites between 82 and 85. Al-Anfal operations targeting mainly the, the rural Kurdish population and political parties, but also observing Yazidis and Christians between 87 and 1991. That is, my, that is the history that I give it based on my study. Otherwise, it is 88. Shiite religion, uh, religious cleansing of the Sunnis in between 2006 and 2007, the Sanjar operation of the Islamic State against Yazidis and its exterminatory violence against Christians, Caucasians, and Shebek between 2014 and 2017. Among the multiple other forms of violence is the ongoing Turkish state's invasion of the Kurdistan region of Iraq that is covered under the rhetoric of fighting terrorism. In Iraq and Kurdistan, memories of these separate historic violence are understood in accordance with the colonial calculation of homogenization, otherness, and difference. That is, Assyrian memory for Assyrian, Azidi memory for Azidis, and so forth. This particular mode of identification remained one of the foundational fault lines banning other identities and can kill, and kills with abandon. To, to borrow from Amartya Sen. Indeed, the future can be monstrous. The continuous extermination of human beings, which includes knowledge systems and memories, villages and towns, and distraction of ecology in Iraq at large, are yet to give way to a new understanding of history, critical modes of remembrance, or remembering together, or political imaginary, the British and the French imperial politicization of borders that were as much geographical as tribal, racial, ethnic, and religious remains central to what Mahmoud Mamdani calls a permanent majority-minority politics in both Kurdistan and Iraq. If the Sumail massacre and al farhud are impossible to untangle from the British imperial wars of domination and al anfal operations from the advancement of global political complicity in genocidal violence and technologies of distraction such as chemical warfare agents, the Shiite Sunni genocidal violence and the Sanja operations as well, as well as distraction of Mesopotamian art are impossible to think outside of the US-UK invasion in 2003. A systematic violence that is yet to be addressed and officially remembered throughout Iraq the post-2003 political organization in Iraq has come to mimic the techniques of colonial violence that is hard to decouple from the 19th and early 20th century acts of abandonment. And I stay there. Thank you for listening. Um, 
thank you, thank you, Dr. Fazel, for this beautiful presentation. The show covered many aspects of crimes in the past, and that you are not alone in this research or in these searches, but we are all searching with you in, uh, in yeah, I hope in convincing answers. Um, now we are going to have uh, questions of uh, friends here. If uh, someone have any questions, please, you can write or uh, raising your hand is So, no questions? Yes, sorry, I have my hand up. Um, okay, yeah, thank you. Just yes. one, <laughs> once, uh, I think, quite simple question for Thomas. Um, I asked it in the chat, actually. Uh, also, I'll just repeat what I said. If the Iraqi government doesn't recognize the special circumstance of these Yazidi women and children and mitigate them, could it be argued from an, uh, from an international law perspective, I guess, that they are partaking in that genocide? I mean, my, my argument is yes, but I have to say I'm not an international, like I'm not an international lawyer. So I, I couldn't give the, the international law um, arguments for it, but, but on a, Instinctively and logically, that's and based on the research that I've done, that's that would be my argument that they're they're perpetuating the consequences of genocide. So certainly, I think a lot of uh, genocide scholars um, would see it in that way, or like, um, and that's a social sciences argument that I would I would make. Um, but I would be very happy if if we've got some. Um, some international lawyers out there who want to weigh in with the legal arguments. Afra. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes. Um, Is it okay? Yes, yeah, of course. Uh, a comment. First of all, uh, Mr. Moradi, Dr. Moradi. Um, I, I'm I'm wondering if you read uh, Bakr Ibrahim book about uh, 1,000 years of violence of Iraqi violence. Have you come come across this book? It's in Arabic and it's yes. very recommended. Yeah. Have you read it? Ibrahim? Yes. I, uh, yes. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. So it might add further, you know, knowledge to your to your exactly. list to your long list of violence in Iraq. And my question is about the generation of memory in within the generations. Because for example, if I'm taking the Holocaust issue, the first generation didn't want to talk at all. The second generation started to ask and still sometimes they got questions, sometimes they didn't. But then the burden of carrying the memory happens to be for the third generation. I'm wondering, uh, this is a question for our, to everybody here, how is it uh, if, if you have such obstacles among uh, Yazidis, Kurds, etc., to tell their story to the young generation? Uh, it's a very interesting issue to uh, discover about. Yes. Uh, uh, Dr. Thomas, Dr. Murad. Thank you, Afra. Uh, it is um, it is an important question, but um, um, I have actually not only focused on studying the you know genocidal violence in Iraq. I have also studied here in South Africa, uh, where I am at the moment, um, in Rwanda, but also memory of Holocaust in Europe. There was, in fact, not only the the first generation, but also among the uh, the survivors of the Holocaust, but special cases of uh, child survivors, and one special case from the ghettos in, in Warsaw, who, who did not speak for 35 years. 
you know, and left, left only with a picture of, of his mother. But in my case, you know, I differ from, I mean, um, all the studies, in fact, that has been done on a landfall on which I have done research, and in, it's a book that will be coming out next year, hopefully. Um, but also the Yazidi genocide or, or the, or, you know, all the other violence that I enumerated. So I try to not read this as human upon human violence, but also as, as the violence of the modern state, the ways in which the state makes possible such violence. And I published a paper on, you know, the, the fact of the relationship between the Ba'ath party and the Ba'ath state in Syria and the, and the, and the, the making, the birth of the Ba'ath party and the Nazi state. So there was an intimate relationship, but also a bureaucratic relationship between the Ba'ath party later and, and the, uh, the East German so-called democratic republic. So I try to see it through this, you know, through the, the ways in which state makes possible, you know, when, when a president has the absolute right to, di to, to dictate a law or, or when, you know, when, when these laws travel through the bureaucratic institutions, no soldier can, can, can resist them or no one can resist them. So it is not just about human to me, it is, it's about institutions and bureaucracy and infrastructures that are in place and much more powerful than the human. And this is where I, I disagree, I, you know, I connect with Tomas. Um, I understand because I have, I have studied um, the, you know, uh, this violence, uh, you know, genocidal or femicidal violence against the Yazidi population. In fact, it is impossible to, to look at the children without looking at the Yazidi's condition historically, but also the general population in Iraq. As I mentioned, there is actually no legal, you know, uh, no valid legal institutions in Iraq. It's a, it's a kind of, a, you know, what Jacques Derrida would call uh, coup de théâtre. I mean, there is, there is, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, um, it is, the political organization is not political, you know, so there is no ethics, there is no law, there is no morality in place and that is that that cannot be reduced or confined to Iraqis or the Kurds that's part of the new liberal political organization of today and you know we all agree to end with this that uh, you know in Kurdistan you know Hosheng is one of these examples that I refer to the issue of protest I mean the investigative investigative journalists are present the academics are banned in in the Kurdistan region and even actually killed and murdered you know, while the, you know, uh, there are um, the, uh, uh, this, um, this radical uh, former Al-Qaeda Islamic party in Halabja, he actually, Ali Bapir actually worked directly with the Islamic State, you know, and with the leaders of the Islamic State. And there were also Islamic State fighters that I interviewed that they were free in Kurdistan, you know, so, but there is no legal uh, issues against those. So, you know, you see the, the law is like, the, like it was during Saddam's time or the Ba'ath party time. It was only for the poor and small cases. Once it, it cannot go uh, much further than that. Um, okay, thank you for your kind answer. And there is no answer. Yeah, we have, uh, I don't know, 1806. Uh, uh, rising her hand. I don't know if he, she's hearing me. It's me, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, I have one question. Uh, if it is uh, not relevant to the meeting, uh, please forgive me. Uh, my question is that, is that a meeting uh, all uh, about the South Kurdistan genocide or in general Kurdistan, uh, Kurdistan area? Because uh, as Dr. Fazl's uh, are I think very great to emphasize what's happening during the even uh, autonomy of Kurdistan. But my question is that that um, after uh, beginning of the Islam, the first time they resurrect, uh, resurrect the jihad, it was actually Khomeini against the Kurdish people. Uh, so as Dr. Fazl is a uh, Roshalati Kurdistan, I'm sure he's aware of the Hal Hal when he came to Kurdistan. He didn't uh, make the court for anyone. He just uh, randomly only one minute court. Uh, are you submitted yourself to the Muslim or not? You, even people burn Muslim, they, that was a specific question for them. If not, then uh, straight away it was an um, uh, execution. Uh, 
so uh, during that course, there is thousands of the people being killed and there uh, were 24 days in Sunandaj and uh, in uh, 90, uh, I think, uh, I, I don't remember exactly the year, but it was during the time between June, June and uh, um, September, uh, 35,000 people been killed and um, actually it was close to the aid. Uh, there was an argument between the Mela. One of them said, uh, please stop now. And they, the people argue, well, actually, it's only several thousand left. Let's kill them just before the aid. I mean, is that we have an attitude, we, uh, we talk about this kind of genocide only when the dictator is left, or uh, we have a space for this kind of um, uh, talk as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... Uh, of course, the, the conference is about all parts of uh, Kurdistan and even genocide in the Middle East. But the most uh, uh, participants were uh, talking about South Kurdistan and uh, we had one participant, uh, uh, Dr. Saeed Shams, who has a, a paper, I think it was in the stream two, and uh, also for uh, Professor Ofra, the stream two specifically was about memories, genocide, memories and genocide. Um, and there was we a have another about Rojava. Sorry, yes. As well. yes, Dr. Thomas. I was just going to say in, in the previous panel, there was a presentation by Dr. Zara on Rojava. Yeah, exactly. And there was a, a presentation about uh, uh, Rojava. But uh, unfortunately, we didn't have uh, anything about Bakur or Kurdistan in Turkey. Um, so but anyway, uh, hopefully in the next uh, conferences. Um, we have- uh, with a, Shortly with the, with the questions, please. Yes, yeah. You know, um, we don't have time and it takes time to address these issues that you raise in that question. Exactly, yeah. But there is one, you know, one, um, inescapable observation in the entire region, which is called Middle East, including Turkey. The, the, all the political organization in this country, including the Kurdistan regional government, they share a fundamental principle with the Islamic State.